on for pretrial management? Uh, yes, Your Honor. Um, I can tell the court that uh, right now we're set for one hour on declarations the week of uh, 22. Um, my office has submitted our trial documentation pursuant to the local rules uh, yesterday. Uh, we also received documentation from the prosecuting attorney's office yesterday. Uh, I received no documentation from Ms. Tone yet as it relates to her trial documentation, which would have been due yesterday. Um, I also haven't received updated discovery that I've been asking for for some time, including uh, year end 22 wage information, uh, her W-2s and 1099s, uh, although it appears that the information from the prosecuting attorney's office discloses some of the additional wages that we were aware of, aware of from the second employer, but I'd still like to see that from Ms. Tone. Uh, she also hasn't updated her Venmo, PayPal, or kiosk accounts with regard to her uh, business uh, and her business income. So I guess at this point, uh, I would just ask that the court, or at least the notes reflect uh, that I'm still missing those items, that we've not received trial documentation from her, uh, and perhaps a limiting instruction as it relates to the failure to um, uh, supplement discovery or update discovery. All right. And we have Tiffany, I guess it's Tone now present. Yes, I am. I should have an attorney online as well. Who's your attorney? Uh, Terry. John Terry. I haven't received a notice of appearance from any attorneys. The last I understood, uh, Ms. Tone was receiving assistance from a limited uh, legal technician, uh, Ms. Loker. Yes, and when it went to trial, I was I retained an actual attorney who was supposed to be online, and I was working with Ms. Loker this morning to get all the documentation, and uh, he was supposed to be online today. All right, uh, Mr. Is there a uh, Mr. Terry? Oh, I guess I need to re reach out to them again because she sent me the link and told me he was taking over on the case since uh, it was going to trial, and I need to have actual uh, attorney. And they were working through all the documents and everything with me this morning. Well, um, I. Don't see uh, an attorney here. There's not a notice of appearance that's been filed that I'm aware of. Sounds like there's still some, uh, there was a deadline that was yesterday for the upcoming trial week of May 22nd. We're on for readiness next Tuesday. Um, I don't know if we want to just keep it on for readiness, Ms. McLean, and if you want to propose uh, a limiting order or anything at that point in time. Um, I don't know. I have a person named Jim White and a person named John Morris in the waiting room. Oh, John Morris. I think it's John Morris. Sorry. The law firm's Terry Morris and Mosby, I believe. Good morning, Your Honor. Good afternoon. Well, I guess it is. Yes, I'm, I am I'm just entered a notice of appearance on that. All right. Uh, Ms. McLean is representing the other side here. I don't know, Ms. McLean, if you, if you want to recite everything you already uh, have let me know so he is aware. Just that I have not received a notice of appearance from counsel. Uh, we have been uh, communicating with Ms. Tone and her limited legal technician previously, uh, including uh, I did provide them notice of the trial assignment since neither of them were present at that trial assignment. So as of this point, I have not received trial documentation that was due yesterday under the local rules from Ms. Tone. And despite uh, my uh, request for her to supplement and update discovery, I've not received updated financial documentation, including year-end wage stubs, W-2s, 1099s, uh, proof of her secondary income with Bath and Body Works, uh, or updated accounts from her business uh, for reselling uh, items through Venmo, PayPal, and kiosk accounts. So basically, I'm asking for a limiting instruction as to those issues. Well, is counsel asking for a continuance? That's what you'd be entitled to if you feel that you are not ready to proceed. I think we are capable proceeding. Uh, we'll be filing a, a trial brief and issues on today. Uh, you know. We're not we're not at readiness yet. This is just pretrial management. Readiness is next Tuesday. Right. Um, sorry, I'm still trying to manage the waiting room here. This, uh, this, Your Honor, the state has filed um, uh, documentation that we're in agreement with in terms of the numbers to use for the calculation of the basic child support, um, we were perfectly willing to stipulate to that. Uh, in terms of the other information, she, you know, the, the, she's not working at uh, Bed Bath & Beyond. And, and 
in terms of other stuff is de minimis, if anything. And in, in particular, uh, council wants to send me a quick email. I'm happy to see if we have it in our file and be able to provide it. Well, uh, they should already have it in their file if Mr. If Ms. Loveker works within the same office as Mr. Morris, because I requested that documentation earlier this year. Well, I understand that, but in terms of whether it really impacts the case or not, the, the state has provided essentially a third party analysis of the documentation and we think think it's accurate so all right well here's what we're going to do we're going to pass this to readiness on the 16th uh, miss mclean if you feel that there's uh any issues with moving forward based on the information that's been provided uh and not provided then uh we can hear that on the 16th at 11 30. all right thank you thank and we're on for a motion you, to Anna. compel thank you and i did not see any response and um, i did not receive one all right. Do we is Casey Bowen present? All right. Uh, did you submit an order? I did, Your Honor, but I can submit it again. I think it just has minimal amounts of attorney fees and then a two week review. Okay. I don't see one in my, in okay. my file, but I will grant your All motion. Right. To so we're dealing with the motion right, to compel, you. as well as a temporary order. That's correct, Your Honor. The GAL uh, report is now in. Don't see a response from Ms. Erickson regarding the motion to compel. I see that she's here today. Uh, Ms. Erickson, I, any response on the motion to compel? I submitted it late. I was having printer issues and trying to find someone to help me print things. And then the women's shelter helped me print it off and it was all wonky. So then I'd run to the AMPM this morning. I've been a mess, but I did respond. It was this morning. I do apologize. I'm trying to get it all done. It's a lot. I've been very stressed out over all this. So, Your Honor, if I may, what I got this morning was a motion for a protective order from uh, Ms. Erickson asking her address not be um, not be given to my client. My client has no issue with that. Um, and in fact, I already told Ms. Erickson that if she would submit the discovery to me, I would hold back on providing anything to Mr. Anderson um, until she put forward a motion to the court. Um, I, I believe this is a delay tactic. It's what it feels like to me because I've given every opportunity. I've said, you know, just submit it. I'll hold on to it. Um, I've not received anything. So I would ask that um, she be compelled two weeks time, return the stuff, uh, return the answers to me. Cause I, this case needs to move forward now. I'm so doing this all. I understand you're doing that on your, everything on your own. Uh, the request has been put to you pretty substantial amount of time ago. Um, it sounds like Ms. Winkles has been patient and tried to work with you at this point. I am going to grant the motion to compel. So you're going to need to make sure to complete the, um, I don't know if it's a discovery request or interrogatories, whatever, whatever it is and get that back to her. I'm going to ask that that be done by the close of business on the 26th of May. Okay. Um, I was wondering, may I get the protective order on it? So my, the information doesn't, it's not seen, please. I have no problem giving her the, informa the information at all. See, I was, when I was served all this, I just had my baby. Literally. I just got home okay, from the hospital. I, we don't need to go down that road. I know that you just had a child. And no, and I'm just, and that's why I'm so Ms. behind. And okay, I'm sorry. Okay. There's, there's a lot going on. I appreciate that. Uh, it sounds like there's a, there's a uh, willingness. Uh, there's no need for Mr. Anderson to know that information. sounds like Ms. Winkles is willing to work with you on that. I did get uh, literally a minute before court started a motion uh, for order for protective order, but there's no order in there. So I don't have an order to sign uh, as part of that. It's just a motion. And your honor, on the uh, order compelling, I'll just put that there's an agreed protective order so that her address doesn't get disclosed to anyone. Perfect. So I'll, I'll grant that. Um, and then there's a secondary issue of the temporary order. My assumption is everyone's been able to review the GAL report. Is that correct? That's correct, your honor. Ms. Erickson? Yes. Okay. And... Um, we're just asking that the GL's recommendations be applied here and we start reunification counseling. All right. And Ms. Erickson, any response to that? No. All right. Uh, I reviewed the GAL report and Ms. Uh, Langford was thorough, attempted to get as much information as possible and did come up with a relatively comprehensive plan. Uh, so I am going to, um, adopt the recommendation. So Ms. Erickson would remain the sole custodian and uh, the, the remainder of the recommendations as uh, put forward by Ms. Langford, I believe are appropriate given the circumstances and uh, I would adopt those at this point. So essentially the next step would be uh, 
a reunification counselor and working with that. And then we can move into potentially other phases as appropriate um, with the, essentially the clearance of the mental health counselor. Okay. And then um, it's a hair follicle drug test. Um, my client's already prepaid for Ms. Erickson's. Um, we just ask that she take that within 24 hours. I called and I called a while ago and I even told her, told Ms. Winkle about that. Um, and I called because I was going into Longview. I don't go to Longview very often. And uh, I was willing to go take it. And I called. Sorry to cry. And uh, they said that they hadn't received any prepaid. And I'm willing to go take it. I've been five years clean and sober. I have no problem doing that. But I just don't want to go there with my babies and drive all the way there and then have it not be prepaid. Because they asked another person that was working there if they had received the prepayment and they had not. Like, I was on the phone for, like, six minutes. I was going to provide the screenshot. And I haven't gotten to that. So. And your honor, I can ensure that it will be paid. I'll make sure that my client gets as soon as his hearings over, goes and calls them immediately to prepay. Can he also do one? I believe that's the order from the GAL. The recommendation is both. The GAL is for both parties to do a uh, hair okay. follicle. I don't know that Mr. Anderson has hair, but they need to do a <laughs> or something else. Sorry. We can. Um, okay. th they'll they'll be able to figure that part out. So, um, if there is a if you feel comfortable uh, waiting a little bit of time, Ms. Erickson, and then touching base with Ms. Winkles just to make sure that it's ready to go before you head yeah. up there, um, that's, me, uh, that's fine with me. I apologize, okay. um, but I have already given Occupational Health my debit card information, and they will not charge it until she shows up to take the test and submit her sample. But they have my information, and they will hold on to it and charge me. The money is in the account. It is ready to go until the 11th of May. So it is prepaid for, but they will not charge it until she shows up for her sub to submit her sample. That is how it has worked because is it a it is a medical uh, situation, so they cannot like pre-charge and prepay for it until she submits. But it is at through okay. occupational health through Longview or Vancouver Clinic. Either one is acceptable, but it, it is paid for. Okay, I appreciate that, sir. So I'm gonna. Uh... I'm going to give you 48 hours to get that done just because I know okay. that you have a lot on your plate. Okay. And then, um, Ms. Winkles, do you want any further reviews at this point or a presentation or Pres given... presentation in two weeks? That'd be okay. The 23rd. At That's one? right. Yes. All right. Thank you. All right. Good luck, everybody. Thank you. Uh, your honor. Am I still on the case? Our relief duties as of today. Well, you, uh, I guess, technically would be relieved, subject to recall for any trial if we get to a trial situation. Okay, I'm ready, All right. Here, it looks like a contempt that was filed uh, by the petitioner. I've reviewed the information. Uh, any argument, Ms. Gilmore? Just extremely briefly, I know the court has a lot of cases on this docket. Um, again, for the record, Megan Gilmore on behalf of the petitioner and moving party, namely Kelly Comstock. This is before the court on my client's motion for contempt. I think looking to the timeline of this case is important for our motion as well as responsive to um, father's declaration. The state in this case filed a petition to modify in September of 2022. We were before the court on hearings on October 19th, November 2nd, and November 23rd, um, arguing the final orders in that case. At each of these hearings, we argue that father's unwillingness to pay additional expenses and ask the court to provide my client the tax exemptions every year for all of the children. Um, again, based on his failure to pay the additional expenses, as well as the fact that he wasn't having visitation with one of the children. The court declined to allow my client to claim the children every year, but renewed the previous order that he was to be responsible for um, being current on all forms of support and no later than January 15th to claim the children. Um, based on the court's ruling, my client mailed receipts that were previously provided to father in November of 22, as explained within her declaration and requested him to pay those debts. Um, based on the fact that we are simply before the court on numerous hearings and petitions brought by the state, I think that um, father's allegation that he wasn't on notice, these obligations were due, just simply doesn't hold water, um, based only on my client's declarations, but the materials provided within our motion. My client subsequently followed up with the mailing with an email dated um, January 9th, again summarizing the expenses that were still owed and unpaid um, to her. After receiving the January 8th email, I can only assume because he fails to provide when he actually filed his taxes, but I can assume that he immediately then took it upon himself to file taxes, um, despite the fact that he has failed to pay. Um, my client then retained me to draft the attached letter that I dated February 8th and was presented to Mr. Comstock, asking him to voluntarily amend his taxes um, as he claimed them in violation of the court's order. As indicated within father's exhibits attached to his responsive pleadings, he sent me the email on February 23rd indicating that he was refusing to amend. 
Um, at this point, respondent acknowledges that he was delinquent on support at the time of January 15th. He acknowledges that he um, claimed the children and frankly in violation of the court order. My client attempted to remedy this issue prior to bringing the contempt by, again, retaining me by bringing, um, sending him notice via email and sending him notice by mail. Um, and again, frankly, at this point, um, we don't believe that he's current based on our figures, um, regardless of his um, payment following the motion. So we do ask the court, court find him in contempt, award attorney's fees for us, and ask the court to order him to amend his 2022 taxes. All right. Thank you. Ms. McLean. Thank you very much, Your Honor. Uh, on behalf of the respondent, Joseph Com Comstock, uh, we agree that the one of the main uh, components to this contempt filing is timing. Um, as you heard from counsel's uh, recitation, these parties were before the court in November of 2022, and the orders uh, are completely silent as to any uh, arrears related to uninsured health care expenses or any arrears related to any other um, items at that time. Uh, in order to enter a finding of contempt, you must find that my client has acted in bad, bad faith and that he failed to comply with the court order. But the issue before the court is uh, related to four years and I'll repeat that, four years of uninsured health care expenses. Uh, we believe that ultimately the court should enter a finding of bad faith against Ms. Comstock for her willful behavior uh, and for this contempt filing, which has caused my client to incur attorney's fees, to take time off of work in order to uh, appear here uh, today due to uh, the order to show cause that's been issued as a result of Ms. Comstock's declaration. The prior order of child support from Clark County entered in December of 2018 at paragraph 21 uh, provides no language on how often billings are to be provided to the other parent or when payments are due. Uh, the parties, uh, as Ms. Uh, Gilmore indicated, recently modified that child support order. Uh, those orders, again, are completely silent about any outstanding uninsured health care expenses. Um, the child support entered, order entered on November 23rd of 22 in this court, at, again at paragraph 22, again has absolutely no language on how often billings have to be provided to the other parent or when payment is due. Ms. Comstock claims that she sent mailings to my client on November of 2022 with four years of uninsured health care billings, but she provides absolutely no proof. Uh, my client provides a declaration that he nor any of, of his family members received any mailings in November of 2022. And as you can see, uh, clearly her motivation is simply to usurp my client's ability to claim one of the children uh, as a tax exemption. Uh, so for the very first time on January 6th of 2023, Ms. Comstock emails my client four years of uninsured health care expenses. And her expectation is that while she's had four years to make these payments or to make payment arrangements with these providers, she demands that he produce payment for his 47.5% within six days uh, for four years worth of expenses. That is wholly unrealistic. Uh, that's not fair. And clearly it smacks of bad faith. Um, that was the very first notice that he received of any uninsured health care expenses. Why she didn't bring this up in the prior litigation is baffling, absolutely baffling. And certainly the court would give him a reasonable time to make appropriate payment arrangements for four years of outstanding uninsured health care expenses. When you go back and look at those uninsured health care expenses, you will see that items number 67 through 69 and items 72 through 86 don't have corresponding bills. There's no actual bill that identifies that these are child related or to confirm the amount for those. In addition, um, there were um, at billing number 81 uh, indicates on the spreadsheet that the bill was $20.20, but in fact, the receipt shows that it's $17.19. And certainly my client needs to have a reasonable opportunity to review through this documentation, as well as he tells you to meet with counsel. Uh, immediately upon receipt of the four years of uh, billings, he uh, contacted Candy Sanders, uh, who then referred him to my office because she was unable to answer his questions. I met with him on February 23rd, uh, gave him advice, and that very same day, um, he sent a, an email to Ms. Gilmore outlining that he planned to pay his share of those expenses uh, within 30 days. In fact, he paid his share within 10 days of that email to her. And that those billings were all paid before Ms. Comstock signed her contempt motion and well before my client was served with this, with this action. 
Uh, first off, I think there needs to be a modification to the language so that we don't have this gamesmanship by Ms. Comstock in the future. We're asking that the court um, adopt our contempt, proposed contempt hearing order, which at paragraph 13A adds language that says that um, billings are essentially that billings are to be provided on a monthly basis and that the parent who owes the obligation has to make that payment or reimbursement within 30 days of receipt of a billing. Uh, so we're asking that the court adopt uh, our proposed order. Again, um, my client uh, acted appropriately. Um, we believe that he is fully entitled to claim the child as an exemption because as of year end, December 31, 2022, his knowledge was that he was current in his billings. Uh, and then he had this four years of expenses landed on him with the expectation that he reimbursed within six days. The court wouldn't require him uh, to reimburse within six days. That's just not something that the court typically does. Uh, typically, once an individual is provided a billing, they have at least 30 days to settle up with the care provider uh, before there's any type of late fees or the like. So my client should be given the same opportunity, but he's also entitled to reasonable notice. So we're asking that the court enter a finding that he is not in contempt, uh, enter an order or a finding that he does not have to amend his tax return, um, find that he has in fact fully paid the outstanding four years of bills uh, by the time that this matter was filed. We're also asking that the court enter a finding that Ms. Comstock is not acting in good faith, that her actions are in fact bad faith, and we're asking that my client be reimbursed $1,750 for his consultation and attorney's fees. Uh, we believe that that's appropriate. Great, thank you. Ms. Gilmore? At this point, Ms. McLean, through her dissertation, is asking for a modification of several provisions of a child support order that was similarly just entered. Um, both the previous 2018 order as well as the 2022 order indicates in Section 23 that any un unpaid support is still owed. Um, so the court still has jurisdiction. There's no foregoing or relinquishment of this obligation. Um, similarly, as counsel noted, there is no notice requirement on when these materials need to be exchanged. Um, and that wasn't requested um, by Mr. Comstock in, in the November 2022 hearing. That being said, um, he's presenting information like my clients has compiled these records, failed to um, exchange any information for four years, and is now on the eve of him filing taxes, um, pre 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 presented them as a, a tactic for gamemanship. That's wholly inaccurate. Um, my client has, throughout this um, litigation, presented materials on a regular basis to Mr. Comstock. And frankly, I mean, Again, his allegation doesn't hold water. We were simply just recently before the court um, arguing this issue, asking the court to um, allow my client to um, file the taxes because he had failed to pay um, the additional expenses. Um, again, addressing and including these additional expenses, my client following the court's ruling that allowed her to claim the children for tax, or excuse me, allowed Mr. Comstock to um, file a child for taxes, again presented these receipts in November. My client, upon him I'm testifying to the court that he did not receive that. My client attempted to get a tracking number as it was past 30 days. She wasn't able to get those materials to the court, um, but she testifies in her penalty perjury that she did so. Then she subsequently followed up in January, indicating that again, she did um, provide um, mailing in November. You don't see any subsequent um, correspondence from Mr. Comstock at that point, indicating that he hadn't received those materials. All you see is he then, he took self-help measures and immediately filed his tax, taxes in violation of the court's order. So at this point, he's not... Um, defending the sense that he was in violation of the court order. He had an obligation, he was on notice to that obligation. He might not like the notice that he was allegedly provided, but he knew that he had an obligation and filed anyways. Um, it's, it's not appropriate to have self-help. If he wanted to and file, despite the fact that he's still owed, he needed to bring the issue before the court and ask the court um, that he be provided additional notice. Rather, um, he, again, filed taxes. We were then forced to, my client was forced to re-retain me, bring correspondence, bring a motion. And I, I, literally, as we stand before the court, based on my, my map, I don't think that he's current on support. So um, we believe that his actions were willfully intentionally in violation of a court order. My client did provide him notice numerous times. He did fail to pay it. He did file taxes despite being on notice. And we asked the court to find him in contempt. So uh, there was reference to the hearings late last year, and I just was reviewing, and it looks like there was uh, a ruling from Commissioner Nelson. And I, I don't know that this necessarily specifically applies to this, but that's, that's why I'm asking, um, where uh, there was a refusal by father to pay certain extracurricular um, <clears throat> monies and that there was... Uh, the tax says a tax exemption status remains or tax exemption remains status quo change to extracurriculars father to pay hundred dollars per quarter towards costs uh, if costs exceed 
then it will be paid by mother beyond that $100. Um, I don't see anything because it looks like Ms. Kilmer, you were present for this. Uh, was there any arrears or anything that were addressed in the hearing from November 2nd? No, there was no arrears on either side. Um, it was just assumed that, again, we ensured that that language that you would continue to have that obligation. But no, the court, we didn't address that and that wasn't in any sort of a judgment. All right. Here's what's, I think, painfully obvious. There, um, Four years is, is an extended period of time. I don't, my assumption is it's hard to prove a negative. So if Mr. Comstock was supposed to say, hey, I didn't receive something in November that I had no idea you sent me. Um, and I guess the same goes for Ms. Comstock. If she sent something via mail, um, snail or electronic, she may or may not have any receipts of that. I don't have anything that shows that he was given notice apart from in um, January of this year as outlined in the um, contempt on um, the motion for show cause. Additionally, it, it looks as though um, as far as the uninsured medical costs and in the motion, it says 941.15. And then there was another portion where I think the, the numbers are a little bit different, um, but it appears that those were paid relatively immediately. So there's, and, and I know Ms. Gilmore, you kind of alluded that it's still not paid in full. And I guess uh, if you could expand on that just briefly. Um, based on my motion, it looks like he owed $941.15. He, as provided within his materials, he provided a receipt that he paid. And I don't have it in front of me. I can quickly try to find it. Is that the like 858 yes, or 800? It, it was 800 something. something okay. And that was in sometime in March. And again, he owed as, or he was had an obligation to pay as of January 15th. So, and as my client outlined in his declaration, the receipts that he received on January 9th showed that there was $1,788.37, which was owed for the past four years. His obligation would have been 47.5% in under the prior order. Uh, however, he in fact paid 48%, which was the $585 and I'm sorry, $558.41 on March 1. And then we've also provided proof of other billings that he has paid that have subsequently been provided to him since that January 9, uh, I believe it was January 9 email. So uh, I can't make heads or tails in reviewing through the financial documentation as to the difference between the two billings submitted by um, Ms. Comstock and my client paid based upon the billings and the amounts that were owed based on that January email. And, and again, I would point out that there's $368 potentially of those billings that are disputed because they don't verify that they are in fact the children's expenses. And then we have that one that is actually billed at the wrong amount in the, uh, in the spreadsheet compared to the actual receipt. Here's what I'm going to do. I, I think this is a, a bit of a mess. I understand uh, both sides uh, of the argument here. Clearly, there was some frustration last year with making sure that Mr. Comstock was... Um, paying his reasonable portion of uh, some of the expenses in this case. I also, frankly, don't see if there was something that was sent to Mr. Comstock earlier, I'm, I'm assuming that that would have been provided if that was available. Conversely, I can't expect Mr. Comstock to say I didn't receive something that he may or may not have known about um, coming his way. So I'm, I'm going to work off the contempt order that Ms. McLean, I'm not going to make a finding of contempt. I'm not going to uh, order any uh, money judgment in this case. Uh, I am going to, in the, under section two, sorry, three, uh, A and B, I'm leaving the way they are. I'm going to allow him to keep his, um, the, I'm not going to make him amend his taxes at this point. Uh, however, I'm going to, I am going to adopt the language. Uh, so I'm straight and I'm striking C and D from section three. Uh, and then in section eight, I'm lining out any money judgment. I think 13 A and B are appropriate. Um, and that I'm just going to add in one uh, last section under A that um, all year end billing must be submitted and I guess I'm by December sure 30th of each year, because since there's tax implications and there's potential filing of taxes, some people do that rather quickly and have all the information they need in January. Uh, and I don't want, uh, so all year in billing must be submitted by December 30th of each year. 
And then the language about uh, everything up to date by the 15th of January would remain as it is. Uh, but I don't want last minute billing coming in uh, when there's tax implications. So two uh, questions. First off, on paragraph two, would you change the hearing date from April 18th to May 9th since we set this matter over? Yes. And then second, when you say a year in billing, I'm assuming that just so that I know how to instruct my client, because obviously if the children are seen sometime in December, those billings may not be received until January or whenever it goes through the EOB process with insurance. So it might be sometime in the future. So I'm assuming you're, when you say year end billing, you mean billings that have been received. Any, anything that's received and known, and hopefully the monthly nature of this will reduce the issue. Right. Um, I, I, what I don't want, and since we have that deadline of January 15th, nobody should be filing anything before January 15th, just to ensure that everybody's where they need to be. And and I, I'm adding that in there to hopefully help if there's a December 30th appointment for one of the kids or somebody and they know it's going to be late, communication is always um, ideal. All right. All right. So this is right. uh, presentation you. orders. Thank I you. did see... Uh, some objections and made some notes. So I don't know, I guess first I'd ask Ms. Jeffers if there's any objections that are agreed to or there's uh, any resolution to or if we're just working straight off your proposed and Ms. Baldwin's objections. Uh, oh. Your Honor, I never received any response from Ms. Baldwin with regard to my objections. So I have to assume we're just working off my objections. That's fine. Okay. There are one or two agreed. Okay. Um, I just now have a chance to amend the order. So on uh, her objection number four, um, dates should be June three to four. Um, I agree. Similarly, uh, her objection number eight, section 1404, um, as far as providing notification where you're away from home, I'm fine to strike that. That's just a boilerplate for me, um, but fine to strike that provision. So that, I think those were the only ones that were agreeing. We can, um, I don't know who you want to hear from first. I know that you've looked at them. I can just kind of go through my little rebuttals and then you can make decisions or, or if you want to go about it a different way. Um, let's talk about the 191s. I know that there was an objection. Um, initially, I think my ruling was that I adopted anything that was in the previous order into this order. There was an objection on 3B and the substance abuse portion. Right. So, so I think I'm pretty aware of where, uh, Ms. Jeffers stands on that one. So Ms. Baldwin, if you want to respond. Right. So on the section 3B, if you look at the guardian ad litem report on page nine, at page nine, uh, it says Ms. Vick reports that she was on oxycodone for seven years. And then subsequently, Ms. Vick states that she was an occasional user of drugs. Um, so both of these parties do, per the guardian ad litem, have a substance abuse history. Um, it's reasonable to have a finding that they both have a history. They've both been clean um, for a substantial amount of time now as well. And your honor, this was not argued in front of the court, a prescription medication, Mr. Rance is on prescription medications right now. That would not meet the definition as far as I would argue to the court. In any event, the, the, your ruling was clear. It said that the findings that were made initially will remain. And I'm reading straight from the clerk notes and my own notes. Um, the initial parenting plan, that factor only applies to Mr. Rance. Although he's argued this against mother several times, the court has never found it and it was not argued be before your honor. Thank you. All right. I'm going to, I'm going to reserve. So I'm going to strike that section. Uh, I'll indicate that it can be reserved, but um, in reviewing my notes in the minutes, I'm, I'm not making that finding at this point. Yes. A, so it's section, second paragraph. So it's section four, your honor, page two, section four is my next objection. Okay, sorry. And and I'm just going to say briefly, mother doesn't actually have a problem with this. It's just that father continues to push this mother's got this issue, mother's got this issue when he's got the issue. And so it seems to imply that she's got the substance abuse issue. Um, otherwise, she, she doesn't have a problem with it. She's not a drug user. I, I'm going to leave that language in. I don't think... I don't think it implies that, and especially when we have the uh, re reserve of the 3B portion. Okay, and the next is um, page three at the very top of 5A. Uh, this certainly was not anything that the court ruled on, and uh, certainly I would argue that it's inappropriate. I mean, father gets the child on days that the child doesn't even have appointments. I don't want this gameplay where father makes a bunch of appointments without consulting mother and, and that type of thing. When it comes to the day-to-day um, appointments. You can make those when the, the child is in your care. 
father's never made any of these appointments. So we just don't think that it's appropriate at this point. And especially not making all the decisions. The father's only known the child for 10 months, making all the decisions about what immunizations that he has and, and things like that. Just don't think it's appropriate. Um, so again, uh, so we're looking at the top of uh, page three. These are, this is standard language. Um, if it's joint decision-making, then these are both parents have the ability to schedule these types of things. My client doesn't have any intention of scheduling things on the mom's time. Um, but again, it makes it clear that both parents also sort of have access to uh, this information that both parents are sort of, again, equal decision-makers. So it doesn't allow anybody to make these decisions um, unilaterally. It just allows regular schedule. I fully understand mom's concern. Uh, there shouldn't be, and I'm happy to add this in the order if parties think it's appropriate, but I, I don't think so if, if uh, dad has child, you know, Friday evening to Sunday evening or Monday morning, uh, dad shouldn't be making appointments for the child on Wednesday afternoon. Um, right. And uh, I understand, especially if I don't tell mom about that appointment, mom misses that appointment. And then you say, hey, mom didn't take the kid to, uh, you know, a wellness child check. And then that looks bad. So I, I get the concern. Um, I also uh, understand, you know, the wanting the kind of, equal uh, opportunity here. So I, I would be willing to add the language if parties agree that, you know, uh, parents, appointments are made during their own parenting time. Something that simple. I have no objection to that. And your honor, I would ask that the language also indicate with historical providers, father lives, uh, what, an hour, hour and a half away in Oregon. So I don't want this argument over, oh, now he's got doctors down in Oregon and those are the doctors he needs to go to. The child's always had the same providers in the area. Father already has a release of information and is aware of this. All right. So I've just included parents only make appointments during their parenting time with historical medical providers. I think um, if, if you want to, if we want to add the language about not changing medical providers without an, you know, an agreement between the parties, I can do that. I don't know if that's the best place to do that. Um, or if, if that's just kind of an agreed understanding. I'm fine with the language that your honors put in. I think that that's sufficient. All right. I agree. Um, this is an issue that we actually talked about on the record where father already has all electronic access to the child's records and things like that. Um, so, you know, we talked about the fact that because he's allowed access, mother shouldn't have to report to father. Um, you know, this is a case with uh, domestic violence allegations, uh, things like that. They can only communicate um, over my family wizard. And since he has access, we just ask that it be stricken again. We don't want this. Oh, you know, um, son brought home an art project and because you didn't send it to father right now, uh, you're in violation of the parenting plan. So E is only as to school notices, not work, um, not school work or, you know, spelling assignments or those types of things. And uh, I think everyone's aware that while grades and um, things like the standard school schedule may be posted online, there's a lot of things that come home that aren't accessible online. So my client is concerned that he'll miss out on the Veterans Day assembly and he'll miss out on, hey, there's basketball and here's the basketball schedule because those aren't available online. So his concern isn't for the things that are available readily online, but instead the things that are important to children that only come home through a handout or a flyer. And again, Your Honor, those things are online 100% as well as missed assignments, et cetera. So here's here's the dilemma. I think as it's written, um, that could be seen as a kind of a, an overwhelming burden potentially. But if you add in what's not available online, then then one party's checking, okay, is this available online? So it's a, it just seems like uh, a, a bit of a burden. That being said, I also understand that, you know, there could be uh, flyers sent home about certain activities that may or may not uh, get on the website. I went just randomly, random side story, went to go check uh, a friend of mine's baseball schedule at Kelso High School and the baseball schedule was still 2021. So um, that's that's the concern I have. And I don't I don't know that all schools do that or don't do that, I guess. Um, so I'm fine to add that aren't available online. If mom wants to sort of be the one that puts that piece of the burden on herself, that's fine by us. And I guess I just say mom shouldn't be tasked with having to go and compare every single thing that comes home to what's online. I mean, the reality is kid isn't in extracurriculars or anything like that. I, I understand that. that it, it, I think it is kind of a burden, but I am going to add that is not available on um, online. My hope would be that within a 
relatively short period of time, there'll be kind of knowledge of what's going to be readily updated on the website and maybe what's not. Okay, and then there was section M. Uh, 14K, Your Honor, which is okay. on uh, page eight. This provision, and I'm looking at my notes and the clerk notes right now, that provision only applies to father. Uh, I mean, I guess it's fine, but both parties can attend a child's events, but um, the court specifically said that father is um, not to interact with mother and if it's necessary to engage in that particular way. So the court, if you look at your, if you look at the minutes and then for my recollection, there was sort of this expressed concern. Um, my client says, I just want to be able to attend. Um, the court said, great, basically don't have contact, but hey, you know, to, and my impression was to the both of you, everybody sort of be on your best behavior. Um, and so my impression was sort of, yeah, dad can go. Yeah, dad should not make an effort to interact with her. But if it happens, you both are to be on your best behavior. So that's how I worded it. Yeah, I, I'm fine with the language in K. I'll leave that. And your honor, next is page nine, and that's going to be M2. Um, at, at this point, the court has limited, um, you know, contact to some degree between the father and child. Uh, mother thinks it's highly inappropriate for father to want to be able to read all of the child's emails, personal emails and things like that. I mean, they just started having visitation outside of reunification recently. So um, it seems inappropriate for father to have access to that information. Unless the child wants to voluntarily give it to him, that's fine. Um, I, that's I, re I reviewed this and I re reviewed my notes. Um, and here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to strike the first two sentences and I'm going to leave the last one. So either parent may restrict the child's access to social media or online content while they're in their home. Uh, I'm not going to require uh, passwords exchanged. My hope would be that there's um, trust established that that can happen. Mom may already have that. Um, and hopefully dad, but at, at this point, I'm not uh, inclined to, to grant that, but I, I do think it's appropriate. If dad doesn't want child on Facebook for the entire weekend that they're together, that can be completely and totally limited by dad. Thank you, your honor. The last issue is page 10 and that's going to be section P as far as, I mean, the court never ordered that father can just start going for urine analysis and hair follicle tests on mother and that she has to report to places within 10, two days, et cetera. Um, she doesn't have any history and quite frankly, I don't even remember this being a ruling of the court. I can't find it in the notes, my notes. Um, it was previously in place and we would indicate against father only, uh, but this wasn't even argued. So again, just going back to the same guardian ad litem report, they both have a, not a minor history with drugs. Um, when mom says that she was on oxycodone for seven years, that is not a small amount of time. Um, this is sort of, uh, going back to judge worms uh, antenna theory, people tend to find like people, I think it's reasonable and in the child's best interest that both parents, um, not be using. Okay. I'm going to make, I'm going to make some changes to this portion. I have a, just historically some issues with some of this kind of boilerplate language that's often used. So, um, I, I'm going to, I'm going to have it include both parties. I'm going to change the two hours to, uh, six hours change. Um, section five, I frankly just hate altogether. Um, so, uh, you know, if, it, if there's a positive alcohol test for an adult that may or may not have a, a significant problem with that, then that didn't, I'm not going to have that terminate residential time. So if there's a positive drug test, then the parties can come to court. I'm not having, I'm, uh, uh, the party's residential time immediately suspended. Uh, uh, then the matter may be set before the court or the matter shall be set before the court as soon as possible. Uh, and then the remainder six through nine would be uh, I'm not making any changes there. Okay. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Counsel. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a great okay. afternoon. Do we have? All right, Mr. Levitt. Is it Levitt or leave it? Love Love it. It, Your Honor. Okay. I got it right the first time. All right. Um, we are here for temporary orders. What? For you today, namely yeah. Courtney Rogers here at my client's motion uh, to establish a temporary parenting plan as well as order of child support. I think the initial the stepping off point is that it looks like we're agreed on the child support. We had no idea initially how much money Mr. Burton was making. You know, we're provided that through the sealed financials. 
uh, for Mr. Levitt's office, we agree with the $1,012 per month in support. We're asking the effective start date to be April 1st of this year and also asking provision that uh, reserves on any back support or arrearages that may be owed um, and deciphered once we exchange the completed discovery on this. So I, I think that issue is largely resolved. That's just taking uh, the proposed worksheets that filed on Mr. Burton's behalf and, and adopting those numbers for now. And I, I think that's appropriate. I think my client's primary concern, and you can see this clearly in review of the file and the pleadings, is uh, how it pertains to a parenting plan and potential uh, contacts between Mr. Burton and the eight-year-old child, Asher. Uh, Asher has speech delays. Uh, Asher is currently on an IEP at school. He's doing well uh, outside of, of dealing with those uh, matters. Uh, but my client, and it's largely undisputed, has been this child's primary parent uh, since birth. Uh, my client has done all of the caretaking for this child, and sadly, Mr. Burton has largely been absent. I think if you look at his declaration and the pleadings on that, it was somewhat surprising to see that, you know, essentially he didn't decide to pursue any kind of visitation or relationship with his child uh, due to financial concerns because he knows the cost of that uh, based on what his friends and members of his family you know, have experienced in uh, custody matters uh, previously. Despite that, my client has opened the door uh, willingly um, over time, over the past eight years of this child's life to try to foster some kind of relationship. And that's largely been met with I don't want to call it reluctance or resistance, but just kind of a lack of empathy and lack of um, concern or interest on Mr. Burton's behalf to follow up with those. Now, my client details for you, and again, it's undisputed. Mr. Burton has had no contact with Asher since Christmas of 2021. We're now going on approximately 17 months of no birthday cards, no Christmas gifts, and no real extended uh, requests for contact. Again, largely because it just it doesn't work in his schedule. Only time that uh, Mr. Burton appears is around the same time that uh, DCS reaches out to the parties and says this is a case that probably warrants child support. That was last fall. And then my client would start getting some you know, somewhat vague, ambiguous messages that, well, I'd like to see my child if I'm going to pay uh, child support. Clearly, Asher is not something you buy. Now, he's a child. Now, this is a child who deserves a relationship that's going to be stable and consistent. And up until this point, there is zero lack of emotional ties between Asher and his father. Uh, there's been a complete um, aspect of neglect on this uh, case for the past several years. And my client simply wants to preserve what's best for the child. Uh, Mr. Burton is sadly uh, largely uh, a stranger uh, to this eight-year-old at this point. That's kind of our stepping off the, the point at this time. And Asher, again, if, if Mr. Burton's going to be part of his life, Asher deserves a father who is committed um, and serious about the relationship as opposed to uh, something that just kind of uh, dovetails with the financial aspects of parenting. My client details for you that she is somewhat reluctant at the visitation at this point, given the factors and the circumstances over the past several years. Uh, she spends adequate time disputing a lot of now, some of these notions, and I would say they're far-reaching notions that that now contained in Mr. Burton's declaration as far as why he never did reach out or the efforts he made, which were very minimal. Uh, my client, again, gives you various responses to those. I'm not going to go into detail uh, other than to say that, that we would just uh, assume you know, and detail those as, as somewhat of red herrings uh, being uh, thrown out by Mr. The Burton. It's almost a, a Hail Mary of, well, this is why I acted the way I did in the moment, uh, which, again, is not backed up with the substantive evidence that the GAL will review or uh, more likely a reunification counselor. I don't know what we do at this point with visitation. Uh, again, this child has uh, members of the extended family that he is very close with. He doesn't have much relationship with dad. Now, dad, in the few times that he has uh, exercised visits with the child, it's been for an hour or two, typically in a public place, typically uh, with my client supervising or alternatively the paternal grandmother supervising. That doesn't give us much now. now there's been an extended period of absence uh, between the child and his father. Uh, this is a child who, again, at one point uh, has been very well taken care of by mom, you know, but doesn't really know dad. Uh, my client details for you the wrestling uh, match situation. The fact that when dad asks for pictures, she provides those. She's done everything in her powers to try to uh, promote this relationship, and it just has not been reciprocated for Mr. Burton. My client's well aware of the realities of this. So she understands in her perfect world, the child would know Mr. Burton, would have a good relationship you know, with him. Uh, but not only has there been a complete you know, physical absence of Mr. Burton, but there's been that of a financial absence as well. Struck me in his pleadings that he talks about uh, essentially purchasing his time with his child and talks about being my client's personal shopper. She details uh, what the circumstances of that were. And none of what he says is, again, uh, borne out by the evidence. We would ask that if the court is inclined to appoint a reunification counselor for this child, that that be paid for by Mr. Burton. Uh, again, Mr. Burton is making in excess of $110,000 per year. Uh, my client is not making anywhere near that amount. We provided you with the financial uh, uh, information that shows she's making less than a third of what he is. And we're asking that he pay for the reunification counseling if the court awards that or orders that. Now, also asking, um, again, to adopt our proposed parenting plan, which is a very cautious approach at the time between Asher and his dad. I think it stands out to me that my client gives information about the speech delays and the services that this child is taking and Mr. Burton's response is that of you know, simply an emoji in response and no follow-up. That's sad. And I think that kind of details where my client is and her concerns with this, I think it would be absolutely you know, problematic for this child if we introduce dad and then dad falls off the face of the earth again as unfortunately... There's a chance he may do, and, and hopefully that doesn't happen, but that's been the history of this case. 
Um, so again, if, if any contact is made, that needs to be cautious in its approach. That needs to be in the best interest of this child who does have special needs. And we are asking you uh, to adopt our parenting plan as such. Finally, my client is requesting an award of attorney's fees on a temporary basis. Uh, we are asking for $3,500. Uh, she tells you that she had to borrow uh, money for her retainer. And again, it comes back to the fact that we're kind of in this position because Mr. Burton has just kind of floated in and out of the child's life as he sees fit. And that's been largely absent of result uh, for Asher. So we do believe that given the circumstances, given the fact that he is uh, earning significantly more than my client, and given the fact that he has contributed very minimally uh, to next to nothing financially for this child, an award of uh, temporary fees and costs are warranted. We're asking that anything you order uh, be paid within uh, 90 days of entry uh, of the temporary orders. All right. Thank you, Mr. Levitt. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, regarding the child support issue, what um, what would Your Honor like the start date to be on that? I, I think April 1 is appropriate given the, and then we could reserve on any uh, back support. Back support, I don't believe is before the court right now. I'll note that there is a uh, administrative hearing that was just moved and uh, that is uh, is to be addressed okay. administratively. I understand the court can address it as well. I'm just trying not to double my efforts. Um, and then what other expenses would your honor like to allocate at a proportionate share? I don't have any objections, I'm just asking. I don't, are there any, uh, I guess, extracurricular activities or uh, Mr. Zandy, is there, um, is the specialist that the child's seeing through the school or is that a private pay person? It's a private pay person here in Longview. I don't know what the insurance coverage is for that or not. My suggestion would just be, we base any work-related daycare, which there's not much, or under, uh, excuse me, uninsured uh, medical expenses. We just apportion those to the percentages of incomes in line six of Mr. Levitt's proposed worksheets. Uh, I think that complies with the statute. I, that sounds appropriate. Let's do that. Thank you. Um, and then as far as attorney fees, I would ask that you're on a reserve on that. One of the issues in deciding attorney fees is that the court assets the uh, party's financial need as well as their ability to pay. Neither one of these parties has filed a financial declaration since this was petitioner's motion for attorney fees. She should be required to establish her financial need at the very least through a declaration saying that these are what her living expenses are. I understand that through the documents she provided, it does appear on paper that she's making significantly less than my client. Um, there was a tax return in one pay stub. The tax return doesn't tell us how much or what percentage of the year she was working, and the pay stub is only for one pay period. Um, so Mr. Zandy and I will, I'm sure, exchange discovery on this issue. So I just ask that the request for attorney fees be reserved. Um, that could easily be addressed later on once we've been able to get more information be uh, before the court. Right. Um, regarding the parenting plan, I'm not going to make too much argument. Um, my client, uh, he put right in his declaration, the further we get into the weeds on this, the more it's just going to be a he said, she said. And, uh, you know, that doesn't really serve anybody's best interest. He admits that he hasn't been in Asher's life for the last uh, year and a half. There's a dispute about the reasoning for that, but it doesn't change where we are now. Um, uh, so he asked the court, um, whatever your honor orders, he would just like to maximize the time that he is available or that he is allowed to see his son. Um, I will mention one or two things about counsel's argument. The uh, statement that Mr. Burton did not seek enforceable parenting rights due to financial concerns is inaccurate. It says that he has seen the cost such fights have taken on family and friends. That does not mean financial costs. Um, to, to say that it's solely due to financial concerns is disingenuous and argument. So if your honor wants to assume that that is the argument that's made, that's fine. But that's not what he said. What he said was the cost things these fights have taken on his family and friends, not how much it costs them financially to do so. Um, similarly, the argument, it, he hasn't seen his son because it didn't work in his schedule. That is not uh, accurately reflected by the information. I'll trust your honor to have reviewed everything that's before your honor. And then as far as neglect, Mr. Burton hasn't really had the opportunity to provide parenting functions. So he can't have neglected them because he was never given the opportunity to provide care for this child in the first place. There are no allegations that when the parties were together or during the time that Ms. Rogers was supervising his visits that he somehow acted inappropriately or that he did not do what uh, parents should do when they're watching their children. And then as far as uh, the child's special needs, Mr. Burton is aware of them. Uh, I'm sure he will become more aware of them as he's being given more uh, more time with the child. My understanding is that there is a, a, a speech issue. So I don't know necessarily that a reunification counselor would be the appropriate channel for this family. 
um, because I don't know that they would be able to find a specific reunification counselor that has experience with speech delays and how speech delays may or may not affect the situation. Um, when petitioner first brought this case, she alleged that there were drug issues and that uh, Mr. Burton should do a drug and alcohol evaluation. He provided his UA results showing that those are not uh, issues for him. There was a uh, there was an alcohol related offense from I think 2016, which is long since dismissed and settled. And there are no um, there's no I can't think of the word probation or anything like that left. But uh, he also does regular UAs for his employment, so there's no need for, um, for a drug or alcohol assessment. Um, ultimately, Mr. Burton will take what he can get. He asks that it be um, unsupervised daytime and that there be a transition period. Uh, I understand that uh, it's probably not going to be as quickly as he would like, and we hope that it won't be as slow as Ms. Rogers appears to want. Um, and then as far as guardian ad litem costs, that was requested by Ms. Burton. We would ask that that be split either 50-50 or proportional share. All right. Okay, so here's what I'm gonna do. Uh, I, I reviewed the parenting plan and the declarations. Uh, I'm gonna reserve under 3A, I'm gonna reserve both under 3B, I'm gonna reserve everything but lack of emotional ties. I think we can make that finding at this point. Uh, as far as limitations, and I guess, <clears throat> This is going to be a thorn in, in everybody's side a little bit. Uh, it's been a, approximately 15 months since the parties have seen each other. I understand the last time that they saw each other was in for a relatively short duration. Um, what I'd like to see, reunification counseling sounds great and if you can find it and if you can get it. And um, that seems to be kind of a major issue that a lot of folks are having. So what I'd like to see, frankly, is uh, 60 days of... Uh, supervised visitation, professionally supervised visitation. Uh, and um, so I'm going to order 60 days of professionally supervised visitation. And that will be for, um, I'm going to say three hours a week during that time. So if that can be in one, in one visit, that's probably the easiest for all the parties. Uh, and that needs to be, I'm going to have that take place here unless um, mom agrees to another location. Um, you mean at the courthouse? Where is he? Oh, here? I'm sorry, uh, in Cowlitz County. I think the dad resides in the Portland area. He does, and okay. uh, I spoke to him this morning. Let me find my notes. I can't see. It, it takes him about an hour and a half to get to Cowlitz County from when he gets off work. He gets off work at, uh, I think, 4 p.m. Monday through Thursday, 2 p.m. on Fridays if he's working that day. Okay. So, so, so Judge, the other, I don't mean to muddy the waters, but I think this will help. The other practical issue of that is, I think, reconnecting families who's doing the professionally supervised visits in Cowlitz County typically has two hour chunks of time for that. So you want the order to specify for up to three hours or otherwise available by the professional supervisor's availabilities or something along those lines. Mr. Levitt and I can work on the language for that. That, that sounds reasonable. I don't want, um, if they only work in two hour blocks, then you know we can do two hour blocks, but up to three hours, those will be yeah. somewhere here unless mom agrees to uh, take the child somewhere in the middle. Uh, I know that there's the last GAL report I saw had three different locations. There were one here, one Woodland, one in Vancouver. So I don't know if there's a new place, but uh, dad should be responsible for for the, the majority of that, um, the driving. Then I'd like, I'm going to limit the uh, decision-making at this point. Um, and I understand if parties don't want to enter a, a full parenting plan, given that I want to see what happens uh, with these super supervised visits. Uh, the and, and just to be put all my cards on the table here, I'm going to be looking at, um, I, I want to see the notes from those visits, how they're going. And I also want to, uh, ensure that he's where he needs to be when he needs to be there. Because that seems to be uh, a point of, of contention that he's gonna actually put in the uh, the time and the effort to get these things scheduled and take advantage of uh, the opportunity to see the child every every week. That being said, I do understand that sometimes there's scheduling issues with um, the supervision places. So uh, obviously the court's willing to take that into consideration as, as a mitigating factor there, but uh, the child support uh, sounds like that's agreed, and I will happily sign off on that order. It looks like one thousand twelve dollars with a start date of April first, twenty twenty three. I am going to reserve on back support, even though that hasn't uh, officially been brought up. As for attorneys' fees, uh, I'm going to I'm going to uh, grant fifteen hundred dollars in attorneys' fees now, and I'll reserve on any other requests for fees pending additional uh, financial declarations. Did I miss anything? You want to reserve on the GAL, I'm assuming, and then payment for reconnecting families. Uh, is that dad's expense for this professionally supervised visits? Yes. 
And GAL, and we can either do proportionate or we can we can reserve with uh, until we get more information. If the parties want, um, we can do county pay with uh, and reserve for paying back. I, I don't care how how you want to do that, but well, do you want to? I guess, practically speaking, if it's 60 days, do you think it would be advantageous to a GAL to have that under his or her belt to review the visitation notes and see how those have gone? Or do you want to just appoint one now and do it at the same time? Or do you have a preference? It probably wouldn't be. I think it probably would be beneficial to both parties to have that information with the GAL able to kind of work off that. So let's. So if the parties are comfortable reserving uh, and entering a GAL uh, six to eight weeks from now, once we have kind of a track record uh, of things for them to start with, I'm perfectly okay with that. I would propose that we appoint one now and put a uh, report due date six to eight weeks later than we otherwise would have. That way the questionnaires can go out and the parties can get started so that the GAL isn't catching up. Uh, okay. Anne Heights next on the list, we'll take her. Okay. And then at this point, let's just do proportional pay on the GAL and, in, and then if there's a request for something different, I'm happy to entertain that once we get more information. The presentation on May 30. Does that work for you, Mr. Levitt? I believe so, Your Honor. I will draft the child support order, child support worksheet, since we're using my worksheets anyway. If uh, Mr. Zandi wanted to draft the temporary order parenting plan and uh, order appointing, I think we got it. And I assume we're just going to reserve on the tax exemption, Mr. Levitt. I, either way, I would just, I'm assuming that she claimed for last year. Um, did. So I would say I, I'd ask Your Honor to allow him to claim this year. I know he's going to, he will be paying back child support. Um, but leave it up to your honor. I'm going to reserve on that for now, okay. and we'll, but let's make sure to get that address before we get too far down the road. Um, okay. I'd like to find out, uh, I do see the states, um, an involved party in the case and I don't want to, if they're going to, uh, get a resolution uh, to the back support, uh, I'd be nice to know what that is. And show cause was forward. filed. It's like on March 20 and, um, we set this over. I've reviewed. Pretty much everything I did get. There was a essentially just 147 pages of sealed financial source documents and a nine page declaration. And then there was a six page responsive declaration. Was there anything else that I missed that was filed? I think, I think that's everything. I think that's everything in your okay. honor. And we apologize for the size of that financial uh, documents, but it shows where my client has started and where she is now. I'll keep my argument pretty brief as my, as your honors uh, just stated, that there's uh, quite a few documents in the file already. My motion in and of itself is pretty inclusive. I included a, a lot in there. Uh, but what we're asking for today is to find that uh, Mrs. Freidenberg is in contempt for violating the temporary family law order and the order of child support. I've laid out in my motion as to the basis for each. Um, to summarize, Ms. Freidenberg is required to pay $1,000 per month in uh, spousal maintenance. My client provides for the court that only uh, two payments of $500 have been made since entry of that order. Uh, Ms. Freidenberg at this point is in arrears as of February 28th, obviously acknowledging we're mid-May at this point, but as of the date of my motion, uh, she was in arrears of $6,000. Um, that is clear violation of the court order. She has not made active efforts to make those payments. Um, and, and it is a willful and intentional violation. If you look at uh, the declaration of my client and the financial records provided, um, she's spending a lot of uh, money frivolously. She's going on several vacations. Uh, my motion indicates that she's been to Florida, Hawaii, Hood River, Leavenworth, Lincoln City, just to name a few. Uh, so instead of supporting her family and supporting her husband, as she has done throughout the lifetime of the marriage, and instead of supporting her children, she's in, instead choosing to spend her money on uh, frivolous vacations. Uh, looking next to uh, the bills, as again, outlined in my motion. Um, there's several bills that she was required to pay pursuant to that order, uh, namely the Fiber Federal Credit Card, the CARE Credit, and the Red Canoe Line of Credit. Uh, my client outlines what payments have been made, what payments haven't been made. Uh, the Fiber Federal Credit Card, she's in arrears at the point of my motion, $1,297. The CARE Credit, um, he is overpaid. She has only paid $100, so he, she's in arrears $600 for that one. Uh, the Red Canoe Line of Credit, $1,216 in outstanding payments. Um, so it's clear that Ms. Freidenberg is um, chosen her priorities different than continuing to support her family as she did the lifetime of the marriage uh, and supporting her husband. Looking next to child support, I understand since this motion has been filed, Ms. Breitenberg has uh, become current, as I've seen in her uh, sealed financials. That doesn't negate the fact that this motion was necessary to necessitate her bringing her account current. At the time of my motion, uh, she was $6,023.44 in arrears. Um, it's contempt. It's willful. It's an intentional violation of the court order. Uh, the responsive pleadings provided by Mrs. Freidenberg asked the court to essentially say, 
yeah, she can't afford it. She doesn't make enough money to, to substantiate all of these charges or these um, costs, excuse me. Uh, that's simply not true. Again, as I mentioned, she's going on vacation. She's spending money frivolously. She's not working the same amount of hours that she was working at the time of this separation. I understand she indicates that um, overtime just isn't offered. However, I think the court can take judicial notice. We're still in a, in a healthcare crisis. Uh, nurses are always, always working. You can actually see if you look at her time cards, some months and some paychecks, she's working substantial hours, getting substantial pay, uh, and others she's using sick time and vacation time and simply choosing not to work. So I think that that speaks volumes as to her intentions, speaks volumes as to her willful and intentional violation of these court's orders. So we are asking the court to find contempt. We're asking the court to issue a civil penalty of $100, attorney's fees of $750. I think that that's generous given the amount of work and the amount of back and forth that we've put in prior to bringing this motion. As contained in my motion, there's several emails going back and forth between Ms. Dow's office and mine simply saying, hey, where's she at with these payments? She's late. She's not making these payments. We've made active efforts, substantial efforts in order to get her to make these payments, to continue to support her family as she's court ordered to do, to no avail. She's thumbing her nose at the court, thumbing her nose to my client saying, see, I'm going on all these vacations. I'm not paying you. I'm not supporting our household. I'm not maintaining our community obligations, uh, which she was court ordered to do. There was no reconsideration filed after the temporary orders hearing. There's since been no motion filed asking for a modification of those. The response of pleadings provided by Mrs. Freidenberg is essentially asking the court to make a modification in lieu of making a finding of contempt. And that's not properly before the court. So at this point, we are asking for the court to enter a, ju enter a judgment for all of the outstanding balances, which I've contained in my uh, proposed order. Uh, we are asking for attorney's fees and civil penalty. I'm also asking to have Ms. Fre Mrs. Freidenberg appear on a pay or appear docket every month. Uh, it's clear that we are seven months into at least at the time of my motion, we were seven months in uh, since the orders were uh, effective and there's been minimal payments at best. Uh, so it's clear that pulling her into court is clearly the only way to get her to pay as she's done so since receiving my motion. You said that uh, she became current on something. Was that the child support? Child support. Spousal? Okay. So it's child the, support. Um, um, yeah, spousal support is still 6,000 outstanding. As of the day yes. Okay. So we can, I can, can I white out then that six thousand twenty three forty four from this order? For the child support, yes, but I'm still asking for a finding of contempt. Yes. Okay. Yes. I just want to make sure that the uh, okay. All right, Miss Um, Your Honor, my client has asked me to respond to some of the general statements that Mr. Freidenberg made in his motion. They're of a piece with his attitude towards Mrs. Freidenberg since she said she wanted a divorce. He's angry and resentful that she wanted a divorce. He argued for primary residential custody of the children at the start, and he pictures her having run off and living a life that has no relationship to her reality. Um, it's an attitude that he hasn't hesitated to share with the children, which is not before the court today, but it plays into spending decisions that Ms. Freidenberg makes for the kids every month. Um, he claims that he and the children go without, but she spends significant amounts every month on regular expenses for at least the two girls. Their son won't accept anything from her at this point. Um, she... Uh, uh, makes not just upfront payments for their uh, sports, which are fairly expensive. She pays for basic personal care and clothing items because they don't like to ask dad. These are the two girls. She puts money on their school accounts and pays for extras when they ask. And they're with her quite a lot, actually. Um, anything that looks frivolous on her bank statements, as Mr. Freidenberg is putting it, um, those are expenses for the girls when she has them. And that includes transportation to and from practices and games and appointments on dad's stays as well as on her own. Um, in fact, she does the majority of the transportation for the kids, no matter whose day it is. Um, the trips she's taken have either been for uh, child sports tournaments, which Mr. Freidenberg is well aware of, uh, or they were paid for by someone else. The trip to Hawaii is the one exception that was paid for before the parties separated. Uh, it was non-refundable. And so she went. Mr. Freidenberg is also aware of that. She's taken vacation time, uh, not for vacations for herself, but to take the kids to these sporting events, to tournaments and so forth, including one to Florida, um, a recent one to Spokane and to some other places. Um, she's not thumbing her nose at the court, Your Honor. She's struggling to make payments. Uh, she's trying to keep the kids' lives as normal and as active as possible and still support herself on her own. As far as her work is concerned, She's always been scheduled to work uh, 32 hours a week, which is the standard full time for a behavioral health nurse. Her net monthly income is less now than when the temporary orders were entered, um, partly because extra shift overtime on her work days has kind of dried up, um, but largely because she used to work on her days off. She doesn't do that anymore because those are the only days she has the kids. Um, her expenses have not decreased, uh, even with the sale of the Dodge truck. That was not included in the uh, monthly expenses when the temporary orders were entered in October. We dealt with that as a separate issue. Um, 
between the beginning of the year and the first week of April, um, her average monthly net come is $4,381. She pays $1,604 in child support. She pays a minimum of $794 for community debts and a minimum of $1,970 per month for her own bills, plus about $400 a month in credit card expenses to cover the things that her earnings don't stretch to, like her legal fees, unfortunately, and any unexpected expenses or these extra expenses for the kids. She's in the hole or close to it on most months. She has regular overdraft charges. Um, that was included in her declaration. The only way she's been able to sustain this this long is with access to credit and with help from family and friends. She hasn't asked the court to alter this situation so far because, frankly, she hasn't had the money to pay her lawyer. Um, she's doing her best, but with the best will in the world, she can't come up with money that isn't there after she pays for everything else. We tried to address this right at the beginning in October, that she could either pay child support and all the extra things that she told the court she was continuing to pay for the kids and pay all the community debt except the mortgage, or she could pay $1,000 a month in spousal maintenance and have Mr. Freidenberg at least take on some of the community debt. Uh, <coughs> as far as child support is concerned, uh, it was coming current before this motion. She made voluntary payments while DCS was arranging the orders for direct payments by her employer. She made three payments before that uh, was put into place. The order itself was retroactive for two months, which put her in arrears from the beginning, but she made that up with an additional payment once she got her tax refund in March. Uh, this was not in response to the contempt motion. She was already talking to DCS about where she stood and how she could uh, come current so that she could file her tax return because there was a question of whether or not she was going to be able to claim a dependent. Um, the conference board decision that was issued April 19th determined that she owed zero arrears through the first half of April, which Mr. Freidenberg might have known if he'd responded to DCS's two requests to verify direct payments in writing so that the account could be updated. Um, I'm sure he thought she was in arrears, but it was his inaction that allowed them, that, that stopped them from being able to update the account. Um, as to the court-ordered debt payments, she has remained current on all of them except that vet bill. Um, she deposits money into their joint account for the debts that are set for auto pay. Um, she pays anything else directly, uh, at least within the grace period, even if it's not on the due date. She is not officially in arrears on anything as far as the creditors have been able to tell her. Um, she had to take a $3,600 loan from a family member to pay the outstanding balance on the loan for the truck when it was sold. Um, she's not living the high life that Mr. Freidenberg is trying to portray. She falls short every month but at least the support for the children and the payment for community debts is being maintained. Um, that brings us to the spousal maintenance issue. Uh, she initially made two payments of $500 each for maintenance. We're not disputing that. Um, that was as soon as the orders were entered. So she was trying. Um, but once she started paying child support, um, the community debt payments and her own rent and living expenses, which were not really entirely clear at the time these orders were entered. Uh, she found herself just not, not just out of money every month, but she's in debt even without the maintenance payment. So she's, she's not saying that she has made those maintenance payment. What we're arguing is that she has been unable to. In order to find her in contempt, the, there has to be a finding of bad faith. She hasn't acted in bad faith. She earns a good living. That's true. Um, but it's not sufficient to pay for court-ordered support, all the extras for the kids that she provides, uh, pay all the community debts, and support two households. Like anybody else on an insufficient budget, she's had to prioritize. And her priorities have been support for the children, payment of community debts, uh, the cost to keep a roof over her own head. But then she's out of money to pay maintenance for Mr. Freidenberg. Mr. Freidenberg has been employed until, as we understand it just recently, he has a side business that she set up for him before they split. And she is seeing indications from the state that there's something happening with that business. She gets notices because she's still on the uh, record for one of the people involved with that business. We're asking the court to recognize that she's been acting in good faith by prioritizing child support first, uh, the community debt payments before her own expenses, and recognize that she's just had insufficient income after that to pay for the ordered uh, spousal maintenance. So we're asking the court to uh, dismiss this motion. If the court is willing to find her in contempt for any portion of it, uh, we're asking that it not be reduced to a judgment, but uh, to perhaps allow her to catch up if she can. At this point, that doesn't seem likely. So again, Your Honor, um, we're arguing that she's not acting in bad faith, and we're asking the court to recognize that. 
just briefly, Your Honor. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, if the court reflects back, um, frankly, at all of the sealed financial records that Mrs. Freidenberg herself filed, uh, the court can see that prior to the filing and, and around the time in which the temporary orders were entered, Mrs. Freidenberg was working substantial hours, earning substantial money. Her year end for 2022 was $115,000. Uh, monthly, she was earning just under $10,000 per month. To now say, oh, she's only making $4,000 a month and that's just conveniently after the orders were entered, I think is disingenuous. Ms. Bradenberg essentially has brought this upon herself. She got a, a, dis, a disadvantageous ruling in the October uh, hearing and essentially said, okay, well, if I don't have any money, I can't pay any of these obligations that the court has ordered me to pay. I'm not in bad faith because I just can't do it. When the fact of the matter is, it's if you look at the, if, if the case, she's choosing to work less hours because she doesn't, she's wanting to reduce her child support, her uh, spousal support obligation and her income for purposes of these calculations. The order is the order. She is in violation of said order. Uh, the purpose before the court is to find that she is in contempt because she's violating those orders. I think it's clear. She's even acknowledging, yeah, I'm not paying, I'm not making the payments as I am ordered to do, uh, but I'm not in bad faith because I can't afford it. When I think that the record before the court is, is very clear and to the contrary. I would all just also just notice um, Ms. Dow's argument that uh, Ms. Freidenberg is spending um, additional funds on extracurriculars, money for the kids, uh, schooling and the like. I would also ask the court to reflect back to the child court order where she's required to make those payments. She's required to pay her proportionate share for uninsured medical or, yeah, for uninsured medical expenses, extracurricular activities, and educational expenses. So to say, oh, I can't make all of these additional payments, I can't pay my spouse support, I can't make any of the payments towards my community obligations, but I'm paying for uh, extracurriculars and I'm paying for the kids' lunch money and the like when she's already court ordered to pay those as well. So that's not uh, in, in replacement of the other orders. It's just she's actually complying with that order. Uh, so we are asking the court to find contempt. I think the record is clear. This is willful. This is intentional and it is contempt. Your Honor, if I may briefly, she's that's not okay. working overtime shifts so that she can spend time with her children. She only has her days off with them. Um, she used okay. to work. Those I, don't, I don't need any more information. <laughs> Um, it's, it's, so this is frustrating and I, and I, I was not a part of the order that was entered in October. I understand that, uh, it may seem to, uh, the respondent that this is a giant money suck that she doesn't have. Uh, I will note the most recent pay stub that was provided, uh, was through April 8th and her year to date earnings were just shy of $32,000. So to me, that's still close to $9,000 a month. Um, plus uh, for, for that she's bringing in. Uh, and that's, that's, that's gross, not, uh, not net. So uh, there's, there's money to be had. I understand uh, where she's in a situation, frankly, where the sacrifices need to be made um, and zero payment towards certain things um, isn't sufficient. I am going to make a finding of contempt. I'm going to enter the order as presented. I am noting on section one and section <clears throat> eight, under the past due child support that that, that amount is paid. Uh, and then the rest of the order I am signing as presented. Your Honor, can I say something, please? You are represented by an attorney. Thank you, Judge. Yes, Your Honor. Right. Um, we're here on a motion to authorize Thank relocation on. on basis on behalf of Ms. Collins, formerly Oberman. Um, the court has been able to review the pleadings and the declarations filed by my client. Um, I'll summarize as best I can for the court the situation and the basis by which we believe that the court should authorize the relocation on a temporary basis. First, uh, relocation under the statute is um, presumed with a rebuttable presumption in a situation such as this where the non-custodial parent has um, less than a significant amount of time with the child. The underlying original parenting plan first entered in Clark County um, only provides an alternating weekend plan. As we go into more detail of the case, um, the court can see that the respondent has not had any visitation with the child for close to one year at this point as a result of the protection order sought by the petitioner in Cowlitz County. Um, <clears throat> so here, the situation is on a temporary basis, um, requiring essentially uh, that it be established that there'd be some harm for the child in relocating. The court should grant a temporary order of relocation so long as either the required notice was provided timely or circumstances otherwise warrant issuing the temporary order. And after examining the evidence of the hearing in which the parties have an opportunity to prepare and be heard, there's a likelihood on a final hearing the court would approve the intended relocation. Again, that is evidenced by the presumption that the relocation will be allowed. Um, there are a number of issues in this case, starting sort of at the beginning here. The original parenting plan in Clark County 
provided an alternating weekend plan for the respondent, even though no limitations were found at the time of the entry of the final agreed order. It is, I think, noteworthy that the agreement did have sole decision making on the part of Ms. Oberman. Um, last year, uh, the petitioner's daughter disclosed contact of a sexual nature that she described as having come from her father, and she pursued a protection order here in Cowlitz County that's filed in the exhibit uh, BNA to the reply declaration of my client, showing an accusation by the child that was taken to police, resulting in a CJAC interview, where the child indicated that she had been exposed in a sexual way by her father. Um, his behavior and conduct that, that was raised and alleged in the protection order involved him having multiple texts and calls on attempts to see their daughter before being even told that he was a, a suspect or accused of anything, causing concern on the part of the petitioner. That order was in effect on a temporary basis for some time as the parties attempted to negotiate a resolution uh, and exhibit in the declaration of the petitioner shows that in October of 2022, a request for a psychosexual evaluation was done. That was ultimately refused. Um, subsequently, in the same month, a request for a mental health evaluation for a risk component was requested. That was never done. Ultimately, the parties agreed to a standard protection order for six months, which would be set to expire in September unless reissued wherein the father could petition that it be terminated upon completion of a mental health evaluation for an risk assessment and filing that information to establish any basis of safety for the child. To date, the respondent has done none of those things. Um, contemporaneous somewhat, the petitioner graduated from college as referenced in her declarations and began attempting to find employment in her chosen field. She did apply for jobs locally, that was identified in both her declaration and an exhibit to her reply declaration where she had been turned down for a job offer in Chehalis, uh, I'm sorry, Centralia. Um, however, she was ultimately offered a job, uh, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in Utah. In the middle of March, she received an offer of employment as an accountant that if she accepted, they were anticipating or hopeful of a start date of May 15th, 2023. As referenced in her initial declaration, she sought advice of counsel um, on April 10th, requested the church push back or, or confirm that the date could be moved given this was an anticipated date and not a firm date. And it was at that point she was informed that the date would not be able to be moved. A notice of intent to relocate was timely filed at that point, pursuant to the statute requiring it be filed within five days of being aware or informed that uh, it was necessary and the information required under the RCW 2609.510 subsection two were known or able to be known. It lists a number of factors that to the extent they're known or knowable need to be provided. And unfortunately, even at this point, some of those things are still not known, but because of the firm date of the start as set on April 10th, um, the petitioner filed this request. So when looking at whether or not there is a, a likelihood that the objecting party would, would prevail here from their burden, there's a number of factors the court would look at. <laughs> In this case, a number of them are resolved pretty substantially by the fact that the respondent has had no visitation with the child since July of last year, has taken no efforts or steps to remedy that situation by performing any of the affirmative tasks requested by my client or myself during the pendency of the protection order and the entry of an agreed protection order in March that extends through the month of September. That was an agreed order entered with Mr. Webb by and through his counsel with their input and additional language added where he had no expectation of any visitation until at the earliest September or upon completion of additional conditions of which he had done none. It is at least intimated, if not suggested in his declaration that he's in the process or getting evaluations done, but none of that began until my client informed him that she was intending to relocate. He took no affirmative steps and in fact agreed to the entry of the no contact order and no contact with the child until September. There is something made of my client's husband's status and I think that's appropriate to address at this point. My client prepared uh, her declaration as did her husband. In his declaration, he identifies the circumstances of his underlying California conviction though it does require registration, uh, 2609-191 on the limiting factors for situations where a person is married or cohabitating with the person who's been convicted of uh, sex offenses. That's subsection 2B, I apologize. Yes, 2B, the parent's residential time um, shall be limited if it's found the parent resides with the person who, and then it has a list, uh, either has physical, sexual, or a pattern of emotional abuse of the child. And there is no evidence from which the court should, could, or would ever be able to make that finding given the circumstances of the underlying offense. So Ms. Collins' husband uh, in his declaration indicates that he pled guilty to an offense occurring when he as a 20-year-old college student had in a relationship with someone 
met via Instagram who initially identified themselves uh, in a way that they were perceived to be older. They were going to study at Oxford over the summer. He had thought they were a college student and they turned out to be 14 when he was 20. They never had any sexual contact, physical contact or direct contact, but they did have an online relationship. He was found guilty by way of plea to a specific offense under the California Penal Code, Section 647.6. Exhibit A to his declaration included his guilty plea statement that showed three counts of 647.6, which is uh, subsection A, um, also attached. Any person who annoys or molests a child under the age of 18 shall be punished by a fine of not exceeding $5,000 or by imprisonment in the county jail, not exceeding one year or both. Subsection two has to do with circumstances where a person engages with an adult they believe to be a minor and clearly not applicable under the circumstances of this case. We are dealing with another state's laws, however, and there is at least some uh, case law in California that, that shows that this is not an offense that is comparable under any method or, or um, identification in Washington. Under 191, when the court's looking at whether or not an out-of-state conviction would apply for a restriction, uh, it states in subsection to be uh, that any statute from any other jurisdiction that describes an offense analogous to those listed in these sections. Um, the listed offenses specifically child second and third degree, child molest second and third degree, sexual misconduct first and second degree, incest, and violations of 968A RCW, which includes things like indecent exposure and um, communicating for immoral purposes. In California, this particular statute is by case law a harassment of a minor statute. Um, in re LO, California Appellate Fourth District 2021, uh, it's 281 Cal Report 3rd 900, says that annoy or molest is used in the statute, um, which makes it a crime to annoy or molest a child, are synonymous and meant to disturb, uh, meant to, to mean or defined as disturb, irritate, especially if by continued or repeated acts to vex, trouble, irk, or offend. In Rulis uh, versus Superior Court 182 Cal Report 3rd 795, um, the prohibition is based on conduct, quote, where touching is not a required element. It's not molestation as defined in Washington, which is a touching in a sexual way or sexual manner. Um, in that same case, the court said that as used in prohibition against annoying or molesting, they're synonymous and refer to conduct designed to disturb, irritate, offend, injure, or at least tend to injure another person. That's not comparable to a sex offense in the state of Washington. It's not comparable to a sex offense as listed in 191. It is not an offense that for what he was found guilty of would result in a finding by the court under any decision or outcome that would result in um, physical, sexual, or emotional abuse of a child. So though that seems to be one of the more significant accusations made in opposition to the relocation, looking at the statute, the guilty plea statement, the California statute, uh, this is not a situation where the court is likely to find that there are any 191 factors that would warrant limitations. Uh, Mr. Collins has been involved in um, the life of this child for a number of years and is the father of the half sibling to whom uh, Harper is significantly bonded. It's another factor the court, I think, should, should be looking somewhat significantly at and is very important in a relocation when the presumption is in favor of relocation that there is a sibling that would be separated from this child if she's not allowed to relocate with the mother, at least on a temporary basis while the case is resolved. Uh, the presumption is in favor of the move when the move is not just in the best interest of the child, but the interest of the child and the person of the family. Ms. Collins has in her declarations exhibited the compelling nature for the move. Even in the respondent's reply declaration, he lists a number of jobs in the area that she could have conceivably gotten, most of which were outside of Cowlitz County. They were Vancouver, Portland, et cetera, which could in themselves require a move for the job uh, in order to get anywhere near the amount of pay that she's going to receive as a bump going to this job in uh, Utah. Um, she's been making significantly more than these 16 to 18 dollars an hour that were listed in the job opportunities that he uh, proposed were available here and presupposes that she was not looking for work here, which she was, as evidenced by the denial of employment locally. Um, she is a member of the church and, and most likely was given some deference because she is and was offered a job that was to a significant benefit to her and her family. She has family in the area, a community of support in Utah and is in a situation where the request to move is not just in good faith, but in the best interest of her and her child. Um, there is, in this particular instance and case, no harm to the respondent because he has no visitation as a result of the no contact order that was agreed to. And again, that agreement was made very recently and a situation where he knowingly and 
and with assistance of counsel agreed to the entry of a no contact order where he had no expectation of having any visitation with this child for months to come. Um, the presumption here is that the move ultimately would be approved because my client is the primary parent and father uh, did not have significant time to begin with in the situation where he has no visitation by the result of an agreed uh, no contact order and the underlying issues that have not been addressed by him, the accusations of the child, I believe the court should authorize the move. I'll also note in the declaration by the respondent, um, my client went into significant detail uh, disputing his claims both about the attempts by her to remove the child in some meaningful way from activities or involvement in the community um, from him prior to the entry of the no contact order, that this was part of some concerted plan or effort by her to slowly wrest the girl away from him. Um, we tried throughout the entirety of the protection order process, in as evidenced by the, the email with counsel, to get evaluations done and things done so that we could figure out what was going on so that it could be remedied child was alleging something significant with father. And we do have concerns about the outcome of the polygraph test. And I think even in his own declaration, the court looks at page two of Mr. Webb's declaration. What he states is, I've never touched my daughter. I've never had my daughter touch herself in front of me, nor have I touched myself in front of my daughter with sexual intent. It presupposes with very specific language that he may have touched himself in front of her. He may have had her touch herself, just not in front of him. He doesn't deny wholesale. And that was the same problem he had in the polygraph that was initially inconclusive. My client had a legitimate concern based on what her daughter had disclosed to her. She asked very basic, minimal questions as evidenced in her written statement that was attached to the petition. She then took the child to a CJAC interview for professional investigation. She'd made no more efforts to bring the issue up or address it with the child. There very clearly were significant emotional issues for Harper whenever she would talk about her dad and, and association, associations with him. Um, those have relaxed over time as there has been distance. My client does not wish to keep Mr. Webb for the rest of their child's life apart because as she says, he's, she is 50% him and, and it is important for her to know who she is, where she's from and where her family is. But that does not change the fact that where we sit today and where we have sat for almost a year is that Mr. Webb by his own inaction has not had visitation and this move does not affect that negatively at all. We ask the court to grant the request for the relocation, uh, allow my client to move with their daughter for this job and job opportunity. It's not going to negatively affect school, as indicated in the declarations. Child is homeschooled and had been um, and will continue to be for the remainder of the year with no loss or deficit. Um, and, and that this is in the best interest of my client and the family. And that with the presumption that ultimately the relocation will be approved, uh, that there is insufficient evidence for the court to find that that presumption is rebutted in any meaningful way, such that it is unlikely we would prevail at a final hearing. And as such, the relocation should be should be approved. First, uh, just kind of going through the statute. The first thing is notice. Um, the notice procedure was not followed in this case. Um, my client only received notice of the intended move on April 14th. Um, it's likely that Mrs. had already, she'd already applied for these other jobs. She had gone for this one and gotten gotten a start date. The fact is, is that she didn't give him proper notice. So notice hasn't been met here. Um, we did put that in our objection. Um, this is an issue. Now, Mrs. claims that she had good cause because she couldn't find a lawyer. Um, unfortunately, having a lawyer or not having a lawyer um, doesn't change what the law is. The law is to give notice. The procedures are very simple. It's a form that somebody can print off from on online. There's no reason why she couldn't afford him that notice, except it makes it more difficult for him to find counsel in order to object to that notice, which is kind of where we're at on this shortened time frame. Um, second, now, just looking at the husband, um, we can attempt to look at his plea of what he pled to um, and try to make heads or tails of that and find out if he is actually guilty of sex assault. Or we can go to what he admits that he did. And what the husband admitted that he did was send over 20,000 explicit videos, uh, text messages, and the like. And this were not two minors. This was a 20-year-old and a 12-year-old. I will so object to the record, Your Honor. That was in the declaration, but it's based on a news article and it's hearsay. All right. I'll note that. Go ahead, Ms. Winkles. And we have a 20-year-old and a 12-year-old here. And additionally, as my client states, this case is about uh, a little girl essentially touching herself. And the fact is that that is exactly what the issue was in the case with uh, Miss Oberman's husband is essentially asking a 12 year old to touch herself. And so here we have really similar issues that are going on if they in fact happen. And so my client still to this day doesn't know if there really is an issue here or not, but he would state that we should probably look at the husband, which he only discovered um, recently had these charges against him. Um, my client was unaware. Nobody ever disclosed this to him. Um, Nothing was put before the court. Nothing was disclosed to CJAC. Nothing was disclosed to the police. When there was a concern that the child was being touched, you would think that one would disclose anybody who might have a past history of sex assault. That didn't happen here. 
And so instead we get my client and kind of going through how it happened. First, we have to look at the, the time frame here. Mrs. Uh, takes the child out of the school and moves the child to a different school. Then she takes the child out of that school and starts homeschooling the child. Um, she claims that the child has been bullied. Um, you'll see declaration, a declaration from the school counselor claiming that they had absolutely nobody mentioned this. They had no indication that the child was being bullied. Then we have the child suddenly being taken off teams, different teams like softball where my client was a coach and the like. And then we have this abuse allegation. Now, looking at the abuse allegation, her allegation comes from seeing her child touch herself in the bath. Um, masturbation is very, very normal for young kids. And the fact is, is that she goes about the completely wrong way of doing it. She doesn't ask any open-ended questions. Instead, she says, who taught you this? Um, essentially forcing the child to come up with a name. And she did that until she got the name she wanted. And then if we go to the CJAC interview, um, where they give the child this interview, the child didn't want to disclose any of this. And she states that she doesn't want her mom to be mad. And I the object to the hearsay also, Your Honor, that wasn't submitted. There's no CJAC report. The CJAC should be filed under seal. I, I saw that in the declaration. I, I, I think it's all going to be weighted. So I'll note the objection. Go ahead. And so, you know, we have the, these issues that are that are fundamental to this that kind of rebut the presumption to start with. One, notice. Notice is huge. Unless you actually have a good faith reason for the lack of notice, it's really difficult to overcome. And in this case, she had to have known about it earlier. She's applying for other jobs she doesn't get. She gets this one. She gets a firm start date to move states. And to, to believe that that's only 30 days to up and move everything is unlikely. And she says her reason she didn't have a lawyer. Um, frankly, that's not really good enough. Then we have um, this chron chronology of essentially getting dad out of things and getting the child cut off from the community. But the fact is the child still is with the community. And kind of, this is what, this is what is the most important thing here. Mom is going to a job that has no home there. She has, she has no address. She has no school selected. She's essentially moving her family for a $20 an hour job. Those jobs are available here. So we're acting like she either gets to move or the child stays here. There's another thing where mom stays. The fact is, is they don't have a, a permanent abode there. They're essentially going to be transient, staying with grandma. Then we have mom doesn't even have a school chosen for them. This is a slapdash move. This isn't something that's planned out where I've got a place to live. I've got, um, you know, I'm not going to be sleeping on anyone's couch. I've got a, a job lined up. I've got the school. Everything is set. Nothing is set in this case. This is a child that's already moved to school twice in the last 12 months. And now we're asking child to now go live with grandma in grandparents' house or great-grandparents' house in this case in a different state with no school set up where they're just going to move again within six months. Frankly, that's a lot of trauma, especially for a child that if anything did happen to her, that has to de deal with all that added onto um, the fact that you're now removing her from everything she knows. So as my client stated, everybody lives here. Um, Mrs. states that her own mother is here and has frequent contact with the child. We've got the grandparents on both sides. We've got the great grandparents, the aunts, the uncles, um, the friends. We have her school. We have her, um, her extracurriculars were here. She was very involved with her dad. So we have to look at more than just, is it going to harm my client, but is it going to be a benefit to mom? And is it going to be a benefit to the child? And in this case, there's absolutely no benefit on a temporary basis because child is essentially moving to be homeless. She's moving to a place where she doesn't have a home. She doesn't have a school. Nothing is lined up. That's not a benefit to the child. Mom, mom, the only benefit to mom is that she'll be employed, but mom could be employed here. When she moves there, the difference is her husband will not have a job. So now we're back to a one income a year family. She states that right now they live off of 47,000 a year, which is greater than $21 an hour. So the fact is they currently have more money here than they would if they were in Utah. I understand this going to trial. And at that point we would see if, if it would be harmful, harmful in the long run to my client, but on a temporary basis, the fact is they have nowhere to live. They have nowhere permanent. They have nothing permanent set up. Mom, if mom really wants to do this on a temporary basis, it would make more sense for mom to be the only one that, that went because mom's reasoning is when we move, um, my husband's going to watch the child. Well, considering the husband has a sex assault um, charge in California um, and it was convicted of that, now to be watching this little girl who has already disclosed something is a problem. Um, nothing's set up. And this is the problem. It, absolutely nothing was set up. My client has taken a mental health evaluation, which will be before the court. The problem is on this shortened time, this lack of notice, my client's not able to get everything in. Um, we've requested the CJAC, we've requested the probable cause statement from the husband's um, offense. There's a lot that we've requested. Can we get it in the short time frame? No. Um, dad, if we're going to look at what people plead to rather than what they were charged with, dad essentially comes out with a, har a harassment. Nothing about sex abuse. Nothing. And in fact, it needs to be noted that on top of that, in the order that they agreed to, dad still gets to coach minor softball. And it would seem like if mom really believed what she was saying about child being touched, 
that she would want to protect other children and not give this order that allows expressly allows dad to be around other minors. Um, I've never seen that in order. It's a little bit strange, but it's a harassment order that they ultimately pled to. Um, it does affect dad because dad is doing what was called, what was asked for in the order to go and have visitation again with his child. Um, he's done everything that he's supposed to do, um, but this essentially takes that away from him. It gives him an apple and it, it leads him to believe that he's going to have visitation with his child again if he fulfills A, B, and C, but that's not the case because before he fulfills those, within six months of that order, we already have mom trying to move. Um, this is a problem. It doesn't make sense. They clearly don't have anything lined up at this point. Um, it would be different if they came with a school that we could look at the school in Washington and the school in Utah. They don't. It'd be different if we could look at the address and see what the lifestyle was at the here and in Utah. We don't. Um, we don't have a counselor set up there. If this child has been uh, sexually abused, the fact is that the counselor should have been set up. We have none of that. We don't have anything that we can actually um, do the proper analysis under the move statute and the relocation statute. And so, Your Honor, because nothing's there, the notice wasn't served, that her husband is a registered sex offender, and that was not disclosed to anybody investigating this case, um, it doesn't make sense to allow for this move now. Um, if mom needs to go right now, fair enough, but we have to have a full trial before the, the decision of whether or not to relocate is allowed. Thank you. Okay, first, there's some inconsistencies in the position of the respondent. Um, either this is a plan year plus in the making, whereby my client has systematically removed the child from engagements and community involvements with the long-term plan of moving the child away. Or this is a recent development that puts her in a position where she has to move, plan to move in with family while she's trying to find the right place to live for her child. It can't be both. Um, my client has made clear in her declaration, the situation here is she's going to live with her grandparents, which is no more transient than Mr. Webb is living with his mother while she's finding a place for her, her husband, and their children to live, trying to put them in the best possible situation. Because this is a very recent development, it is a, a sudden and somewhat short-term um, uh, occurrence. Um, she received the offer letter, and it had an anticipated start date should she accept the employment. She ultimately accepted the employment, asked them if the date could be moved, and did not get confirmation until the 10th of April that the date was firm, and she had to be there on May 15th to start work. At that point, notice was provided within five days, where we still don't have all the information we would like to have had. We don't have an address. We don't have the school. But that doesn't have an impact here in the situation where the child is currently homeschooled and will be homeschooled using the same curriculum. That curriculum information was provided in my client's reply declaration and, and shows that the child is having their educational needs met. Um, it is a misstatement about the school saying there is no evidence of um, any uh, bullying or, or anything of the sort. There was a declaration submitted, uh, but it was from a school counselor at the wrong school. My client indicated that the child had been attending that school and instead transferred to Tootle because her child care provider uh, was in Tootle and the child could take the bus to the school. Under the parenting plan, it was in existence. My client had the right for sole decision making on education and transferred the child school within her authority. At the Tootle school is where bullying occurred and she elected to pull the child out and begin homeschooling. The declarant is not part of the school district that that event occurred, that, that situation occurred where the decision happened. So it is uh, I'm gonna say unimportant, but but absolutely irrelevant to that circumstance. Two, reference to an 18 or $20 an hour job, the offer letter is a base rate of pay starting at 2885 with the potential for overtime. So she's gonna be making $30 an hour up to time and a half for overtime as provided by her employer. That's 50% that's more than the income that Ms. Winkles was saying she would be making. Uh, her declaration states very clearly that the base income she'll be making there exceeds what her husband was making here um, by about $10,000 plus dollars annually, and that he will be able to work there in his chosen trade and make money also. He just didn't have the job lined up yet first. She got this offer. This is the place where they're best able to go and provide for their family, where she does have other family support, and she has connections there both through family and the church. Um, it's also, I think, easy to get lost in the accusation when looking at the 191 statute, it talks about the court making a determination on limitations based on convictions. That's not me making something up or saying it. That's what the statute reflects. And the, the guilty plea to which he resolved, what the prosecutor elected to resolve the case as what he pled to was the statute we provided, which is more of a harassment statute than anything else. And though it does have sex offender registration as stated in the guilty plea statement, it's not comparable under any comparability analysis in Washington. It's neither comparable factually, it's not comparable 
under the statutory language. And 4191, it specifically references comparability on the basis of um, a description from another jurisdiction of an analogous offense to those. So I, I believe it's a misstatement to just summarily state that he committed a sex offense. He does have to register, but the offense to which he pled in California is not a comparable sex offense in Washington under any meaningful view of the statute. Uh, his statement is he was 20 and a college student. She was 14, not 12. Um, that is neither here nor there, except it would affect the degree to which they would have been charged if there had been any contact. But again, as stated in his declaration, and even if the court considers the hearsay as stated in Mr. Webb's, there was never any contact between the two of them. There was an online relationship that resulted in the two of them believing that they were in love because he was 20 and she was 14. That happened before he knew she was under the age of 18. And he regrets his decisions. He pled guilty to those offenses. But those offenses aren't controlling here. And it is very inconsistent for Mr. Webb to state in his declaration that he doesn't even think anything happened. But if it did, it must have been him, not me. Child was very clear to the petitioner in her statement to police, she said, Daddy Travis. First, she said one of Daddy Travis's friends, and he went off in the text messages to her. The child then came to the petitioner on her own without her asking additional questions, without her prying, without her trying to pursue an answer that she, quote, wanted and said, I need to tell you what happened, but I don't want you to be mad. When the child was assured, which is appropriate, even under professional investigating techniques, that no one's going to be upset with them. They just have to tell if they want to say something, they shouldn't be worried about being upset. Just say what happened. Not did dad do this to you? Did Travis do this to you? No suggestion. Who taught you this is open-ended. Where did you learn this is open-ended. It wasn't, did Travis do this? Did he touch you? The child volunteered those pieces of information. And then she stopped asking questions and called the police. So she's not professionally trained as a, as a forensic interviewer, but nothing in her declaration suggests that she did anything inappropriate. We're in a situation where dad has no contact. Dad agreed to the protection order. Mother has provided a compelling basis that she needs to move for additional employment opportunities that she has offered. It's not, I might get a job. It's not, I want a job. I have a job offer. It has a start date. It pays 50% plus more than most every job on the list that Mr. Webb provided to his declaration was available in Cowlitz County area. You'd have to go to Vancouver, Salmon Creek, Portland to get jobs that were around $30 an hour. She applied to some. She was not offered any. Um, this was not the only job she applied to, but it was the offer she received. She, upon being informed could, that she could not move the date and that it was firm, she had to start or else notified him. That was from April 10th. He was notified on the 14th. That's within five days. But even notwithstanding that, under 2609-440, um, the, oh, I apologize, Judge, wrong statute. Um, under the notice requirement, um, the court can, even if somebody doesn't comply with the 60 or even five-day requirement, um, allow relocation, notwithstanding notice if there is a compelling basis to do so. My client has this job opportunity that is to the benefit of her family. She has family there also. She has cousins for the child there, extended family there. She has a job with upward mobility and a greater rate of pay. And she's going to have this child's half sibling there. She's the primary custodial parent and the only parent this child has had on a regular consistent basis for the entirety of her life. And the only parent who's been there outside of her husband, um, who's the, the, the parent of the step or, sorry, half sibling um, for the last year because of Mr. Webb's inaction. It's also, I understand the argument that this notice at 30 days out, as opposed to 60 days out, creates difficulty. None of the material that they're alleging that, that they have been trying to get, whether it's the CJAC, police reports, or anything else, would be available in 30 additional days. Everything was 60 days plus out uh, from now even to receive. And two, to say that he didn't have the opportunity to perform these evaluations is disingenuous when the record is clear that they were requested back in October initially of 2022 and nothing has been done to date. Ms. Winkles says that he has had the evaluation since this was filed. That was his choice not to do it at any point prior when it was requested. The presumption at the end of this is that because of my client's role as a primary parent, that the relocation would be approved. In that situation, there is nothing here to support or suggest that the relocation should not be granted on a temporary basis. Visitation can happen professionally via Zoom, once these evaluations are in, the no contact order is modified, reunification counseling, to the extent that it ultimately gets ordered, can be done via Zoom. It is common that people relocate, and it is unfortunate that that happens to families, but it's not an uncommon occurrence where people have job opportunities and family support and other reasons that necessitate a move. The fact that she's trying to do what's best for her child and be as certain as she can about where the school is to avoid issues that happened before with bullying, and that they find the school that's best fit for the child, that they find the best neighborhood for her in the short amount of time that she had to make this move because of the job offer is, is not something that should result in her being 
prohibited from doing it with her family. Uh, reunification counseling is not possible um, if one party is out of state. Psychologists are licensed in one state alone, and you'll see um, the email that we submitted for that. They're licensed in one state, which means if another parent is in another state, they are not able to do reunification counseling. Both parents must be in the same state or the psychologist has to be licensed in both states. Um, that's going to be really difficult to find somebody licensed in Utah and in the state of Washington. What this means is that move effectively stops dad ever having any contact with his child. Um, there won't be any reunification because it can't occur unless dad chooses to move to Utah. Um, that That's a problem. That is a massive prejudice to my client in the long run. Um, in the short term, it may look like dad doesn't have visitation, but the opportunity to not have any is completely taken away by this. Is reunification required under the uh, protection order? It's not, no. It's just what we assumed would happen. Um, so obviously there's a there's a lot going on in this case. I do, uh, I, I think everyone acknowledges there was late notice um, and Miss Oberman attempted to do that as quickly as she possibly could. Uh, that obviously does constrain uh, the response for Mr. Webb and his ability to uh, thoroughly respond. Uh, I, I will note that I think the parties did a pretty good job of trying to supplement with as much as they could in the limited amount of time. Uh, to be very frank, notice um, uh, under 2609, I think it's 460, is it 460 or 30? Um, notice is required. If notice isn't, um, if there is late notice, it's not really grounds for anything other than contempt or sanctions. It's not something that undoes the entire process. Uh, and then the court can look at <clears throat> Uh, if there was an attempt to, uh, you know, substantial compliance, actual compliance, uh, what was attempted there. Uh, so I, I agree with Ms. Winkles. Uh, this, there was a, definitely a quick turnaround here, and I understand there may be additional information uh, that the parties may want to submit to the court. Uh, clearly, this is something that likely will be going to a, a full-fledged hearing. Um, that being said, there's, there is a, a presumption that uh, the primary parent, if uh, a move is requested, that that will be granted. Uh, that is only overcome by essentially a finding by the court uh, that that uh, it's not in the best interest. Uh, this particular move is not in the best interest of uh, the child and uh, the, the the remainder of the family relocating. Uh, arguably, a pretty high high standard uh, to have to overcome. I am going to be very very frank here. There are a lot of concerning uh, issues in this case. Uh, the fact that and and I am not basing my ruling on this, but I'm saying it because this is, I think it is important to say, um, if there's a, a person that's required to register as a sex offender, regardless of why they are having to do that, and there is a CJAC interview with the child that lives with that individual and that individual was never disclosed, that's a problem. And I don't know why Ms. Oberman thought that was not important to relay to uh, parties when this was happening, but we're where we are based on past agreed circumstances. Uh, Mr. Webb claims this is new information to him. It very well could be. Uh, and I can only assume that he may be taking further actions uh, with that knowledge. Uh, it's entirely possible. But where we are is an agreed protection order that's in place that protects this child uh, from seeing Mr. Webb at least until, I think you said September of this year. Is that correct? And it may be extended with uh, if there's no compliance with some of the other uh, requests that were made. Great. Um, I think there was some uh, conflation of issues with, uh, or numbers at least, with what kind of benefits uh, Ms. Oberman would receive moving versus staying. I think $20 or $21 an hour is a lot different than $30 an hour. Uh, that uh, essentially doubles uh, the income that I think Ms. Winkle was Ms. Winkles was using when she was doing her numbers. That uh, sounds like it's closer to $30 an hour than $20 an hour, uh, which could be substantial given the financial circumstance of these parties. Um, I will note there is a, a motion for temporary or order preventing move with the children. Long story short, I, I think I, I'm going to grant the, the temporary move. Uh, I think this needs to go to hearing. I think it needs to be expedited. My hope would be that before the end of the summer, we'd have that hearing um, because I, I think that there are some concerns with um, the movement in schooling, housing issues, what's going to happen, especially if there's counseling uh, and other factors at play um, in this case that frankly don't appear to have been addressed at this point. Um, I'm, I'm, I guess hopefully the parties can take some solace in, in that there are other family members that are here. So it's not just a random place in the middle of the country that there's no connections. Um, so other family members are, are, are be involved. Um, so I, I I'm going to grant the temporary, uh, the move on a temporary basis. We'll make a finding that, uh, 
while, while, while concerned, there are certain things that are in place that the court that aren't before me and that I don't have any control over changing at this point. Uh, so, so I will uh, find that it's in the best interest at this point for Ms. Okay. Oberman and her um, child uh, based on the entirety of the circumstances. All right. So we are dealing with um, the contempt and then a uh, counter motion for relief to change uh, language in the parenting plan. Um, we're running up against the clock here and I apologize for that. So I'm going to just give you both a brief moment to, to make arguments and, uh, I think I pretty much have an idea of where, where I'm going with this, but uh, I, I'm not going to make you wait here all day and not be able to, to say what you need to say. So um, you're unmuted, Mr. Hunter. Why don't you give it a start? Thank off. you. And I'll, I'll make this as brief as I can. I know we were just here last week, so I'll, I'll kind of hit the highlights of some of this. So we're here on a motion for contempt. Uh, this all revolves around a... Uh, February 27th, Mr. Brock received communications from a school counselor that their that the party's minor son was experiencing some uh, some form of distress. Uh, that day was also an exchange day for visitation. Uh, after hearing that news, Mr. Brock waited until the following week, one hour before uh, the next scheduled exchange, to inform Ms. Koski that uh, her visitation was going to be terminated under uh, Section 14D of the of the party's final parenting plan. Uh, 14D states that if you know mother is to involve the child in the residential schedule, the petitioner shall end unsupervised visits and put his concerns in writing with the court immediately. That same day, Ms. Koski let him know that she disagreed with his decision. She denied the allegations that she involved the child in any sort of residential schedule. Uh, to that response, Mr. Brock said, we're gonna go, to, you should go to court. Time goes by, we send a letter on March 22nd, letting him know again that Ms. Koski denies his allegations uh, and that they resume visitation. And if we have to litigate this issue, we'd be seeking attorney's fees. There's also a follow-up phone call on April 4th. Again, Mr. Brock had stated that he was in the process of getting some letters. Uh, it then took almost two more weeks until he was actually able to get these letters from both the school counselor and from the minor child's uh, therapist. Which again, brings up another argument for contempt. The parenting plan also requires that if there are significant uh, mental health concerns for the child, the petitioner is to promptly notify the respondent of those issues. Uh, two months later, it's not prompt. And again, just to reiterate our, our concern with this and why we think that this is a, I mean, section 14 orders typically pretty harmless. However, this one was not. The, the timing of this is what makes this kind of an egregious act on petitioner's part. Um, it, it's how long he waited. It's how long he, you know, not only one, one hour before visitation decides to finally spring this on mother, but even his communications don't even give a good reason. I've heard this, our child has told me um, you've caused a lot of distress. That's all we get. Mother denies it, but father just moves forward and says, no, that's the way it is. Um, here's what I think we're going to do to fix it. But of course, he knows that what they were supposed to do is put this in writing and bring it to court. And he chose not to do that. And frankly, if it wasn't for our office getting involved to kind of push this issue, we may still be in that position. Mr. Brock may still have never reached out because it is important to notice that it was after two attempts at communication with him not attempts, actually two actual communications, that he reached out and got letters from anybody of concern in this case. And even those letters do not squarely paint the picture that Mr. Brock is trying to say they paint. They actually don't state that it was Ms. Koski who told the child that this was the way the parenting plan was going to work or that these were the options he had, only that the child had these beliefs. And again, Ms. Koski states, it's not her that has informed the child of this. Maybe somebody else, maybe it's somebody and her family, she knows that her family has problems with Mr. Brock and has said things to the child that she disagreed with and even admits that under her supervised visitation, she ended supervised visits with her mother because of the statements that her mother was making about Mr. Brock. I mean, to think that the mother would go to that, would disavow her own mom and shut off supervised visits to only then turn around and do something like this, it, it just doesn't pass the smell test, Your Honor. Now, there, the child may have these beliefs, and we're not denying that. The child may have these beliefs, but it's not mother who's putting them there. And there is no good evidence to show that. So for that, just again, contempt is an intentional disobedience of a lawful court order. As of March 10th, the petitioner knew he had to file documents in court. And here we are almost two months later, and we just now get a response from him. So Mr. Brock tries to say that he, it took him weeks to get responses, to get letters. It's hard to get this stuff. It's so difficult to get these letters from therapists. We were here last Tuesday and in a week's time, he managed to get letters within a week. He did it this week. He could have done it two months ago. So for those reasons, he did not immediately 
put his concerns in writing for the court. Instead, he decided that he was going to be the final arbiter of what is true, and he supplanted his uh, his judgment for that of this court's. That's not what the final parenting plan says he's supposed to do. So again, we ask that this court find Mr. Brock in contempt. We ask for a specific finding that he violated a residential provision of the parenting plan. And we're now going to ask to order 17 days of makeup time. This last weekend was another weekend Ms. Koski was supposed to have. As for the counter motion, I filed a, a legal memo that is really the basis of our position. And the fact is, is what, what petitioner is asking for is a modification of the final parenting plan. Uh, modifications of a final parenting plan by statute can only occur if there's been a substantial change in the circumstances of the child or the parties. And that modification must be necessary to serve the best interest. Now, it doesn't end there either, because there is case law in, uh, uh, in regards to AMS that to support a change in a parenting plan based on a finding of substantial change in circumstances, uh, mental health issues must have some connection with the parenting plan. It's the parenting plan itself that has to be the basis for the mental health issues that are experienced by the child. And we simply just don't have that here. Now, petitioner gives about four arguments for why he thinks this request is needed. They break down into the first one is that it would allow for in-person contact. The problem is, is that the current parenting plan already allows for in-person contact. It just has to be supervised. Now, Ms. Koski has tried to reach out to get a supervisor, um, a professional supervisor, but so far there haven't been any availabilities. So that is, that's already there in the plan. That can be done. Number two, um, petitioner thinks that it more appropriately addresses the petitioner's concerns. Frankly, that is just not a significant change in circumstances. If, if a significant change in circumstances were based on petition on a party's concerns, then we'd be in court all day long trying to modify parenting plans. Everybody's got concerns about parenting plans. Third is that, the, that if we make this modification, it takes the decision to terminate visitation away from a petitioner. Uh, frankly, that's just, again, the parenting plan is a baseline. That's what it is. Parties are free to agree outside of that. And, and really, petitioner's in a position to have to determine if the rationale he thinks for terminating visitation is appropriate or not. Uh, he's already made the decision that it was appropriate. Of course, you know, it's easy to do when you don't have to bring it in front of the court like he's supposed to. The idea that it wasn't appropriate, I don't think has ever crossed petitioner's mind, but that's where we're at. And then fourth, uh, it gives the court additional expert documentation and input. While that's fantastic, the court had those same concerns when the final parenting plan was put in place and it chose to stick with the language in 14D. And finally, even if the court does decide that this is a significant change in circumstances, the, the section as it's written is just poor drafting. So, you know, arguing uh, in the alternative here, I think what he's asking for is that the parties will go through uh, counseling um, and that if any party disagrees, they can bring it in front of the court. Well, mother disagrees. It'd be brought in front of a court. Under the current plan, it's going to be brought in front of the court. We simply wind up in the exact same spot. So, frankly, it, it just doesn't even make a lot of sense. Sorry, I'm being pro se. Um, I do want to briefly touch on a few things that uh, he brought up. Um, I did ask for letters from both those counselors. Um, I, the moment that I was made apprised of the situation from both of them, um, some my writings will have a little bit more clarity to that. And I can get um, I can get from both of them that I did contact them both several times prior to get those letters. Um, and then with his him saying that the mother stopped visitations prior uh, when his, when her mother was the supervised visitor. Um, well, when, when we showed up, her mother was at the bar next door, and so she knew that it was going to be coming to court anyway. Um, and then uh, supervised visits uh, in the plan, I, I don't see that anywhere in our uh, parenting plan currently to allow for supervised visits in this situation. But I, I, I try to be as well versed in my parenting plan as possible. If I may, Your Honor, I was going to go ahead and read off uh, what I have. I request the court not consider the new things respondent introduced, which I was unable to respond to, namely the last declaration from respondent's fiance which was submitted yesterday evening. If the court would recall our last hearing, when the matter was set over, the court gave permission to submit additional mental health records, but not additional declarations. Specifically, any of the statements are simply inflammatory and do not serve the motion for contempt or motion for relief. Several statements are contradictory uh, to the respondent's own submissions, and it begs the question, which declaration to believe? I request this court uh, to strike, or at least not consider the information in the declaration. And then uh, um, on the motion for contempt, Respondent alleges, I have willfully violated the order by not filing a motion according to the definition that is not in our orders. Respondent leaves out that I informed her that I was working on a contempt document in which I must outline relief requested. In that section, as I do not have the ability to obtain counsel, I could not ask for legal fees. I am not sure if I'm supposed to request restarting the step-up plan over and thought that joint therapist was appropriate for the request of relief. Respondent specifically requested this, and I responded that I agreed. As the court can see in Exhibit B in my reply to the contempt, when I received contact, from her attorney, I assumed she was communicating this with him. 
as I had offered to draft an agreed order. When I spoke with him, he indicated that there needed to be proof of my claims, and I informed him of the delay due to school breaks, spring break, and the therapist's schedule. I gave certain dates certain the end of the following week, right after spring break, which they did get it to me sooner, but when I would have the documents. Again, I did agree to supervise setting with a therapist, and that I would be happy to put that in order. While there were instances where the respondent tried to engage in altercations with me at exchanges previously, they had not arisen to the level of J disclosing concerns to a school counselor or therapist. The most recent incident did. This incident occurred over the weekend of February 24th to the 26th. Jay confided in a school counselor on February 27th. Jay then disclosed this same situation to the therapist on March 8th, which was the earliest I could get him in. I was attempting to get legal advice during this time to no avail and subsequently informed respondent that I would be implementing the suspension required in paragraph 14D. On Friday, March 10th, Jay did not have a therapy appointment the week of April 5th, and as he has appointments on alternating weeks, when I received the letter from respondent's attorney, which stated the claims were hard to prove, I requested the letters from the school and the therapist again. I contacted uh, respondent's attorney on April 4th, informing him that I had to wait on a letter from the counselors, but that I would have them by the end of the next week. I informed him that spring break was impacting the civility, Council was adamant that I needed proof to claim the contempt, which I had been working towards filing. I also informed him that I was only requesting relief in the form of joint therapy and parenting classes, which respondent has requested and I agreed to. He indicated we would wait for those two things. The only de delay was on respondent's requests and actions and the indication that I had to obtain proof of my claims. I was in agreement with her request and thought we, we only needed to implement the documents. As these behaviors require respondents unsupervised time to be suspended, there is no language which allows us just to decide to do otherwise. Supervised contact approved through the court orders was the most appropriate next step. If we did not have to go through motions for that, all the better. The delay was not intentional and was as immediate as could be expected. The backlog our teachers, staff, mental health, and health providers are experiencing means that three weeks to obtain documents from staff and faculties in the middle of a school break is not untimely or unreasonable. And most certainly is not a willful violation of the court orders. Instead, it is respondent who has violated the orders, which were implemented based on serious behaviors and findings for those serious behaviors in our final parenting plan. Respondent has continued to exhibit harmful and patterned behaviors, which are detrimental to our son's mental and emotional health. This culminated in the incident where Jay confided in me, pardon me. This culminated in the incident where Jay confided in me the things respondent has been discussing with him. As a result, I had explained that it was not me, pardon me, Pardon me for one quick moment. You're, you're fine, Mr. Brock. Take what time you need. This culminated in the incident where Jake invited in me the things respondent has been discussing with him. As a result, I had to explain to him it was not me, but the judge in the courts that made that decision. The courts implement all the things necessary to keep kids happy, healthy, safe with each of their parents, based on all the evidence that all the providers, experts, and parties presented. In this, Jay was able to ascertain that respondent's statements to him were not factual. This is a difficult topic for Jay to struggle with. And as he once responded to be honest with him, choose him and love him, he does not know why she would have to lie to him to make him angry with me to do so. Respondent wants to argue, respondent wants me to argue that when my child discloses harmful behaviors to me, to his providers, to his school counselor or teachers, that it's all hearsay, vague, and the court should not consider them for what they are. Very clear statements of distress and emotional turmoil Jay is struggling with. The language used by the professionals was not vague either. It was clear that Jay was emotional when disclosing the information to the writer of the document, not that he was in some serious twisting of the words of the professionals, regurgitating that he was emotional as a result of his disclosures to me and my reactions to him. The court has previously found respondent violates the court orders in exhibiting these harmful behaviors. The court found reason enough to clarify that and if respondent engages Jay in the plan or if he has experienced emotional distress, the visits are supposed to be suspended. The court did not the court did intend that I implement this restriction. This is not a violation. This is very clearly a concise timeline wherein I attempt to work with professionals in the community as, a, as well as respondent and her attorney to navigate the unclear directions from a court's order. The attorney very forcefully indicated I had to obtain the requested documentation to file a motion. I did not go to, I did not go to law school. And when, I, and when he demanded proof, he knew that it would delay while obtaining these documents. Turning around to claim I have unnecessarily delayed in filing and that I have not provided a clear showing of impact is simply not true. <clears throat> um, the initial letter from Jay's school counselor right after their conversation happened was very specific in identifying that the conversations occurred with his mama Bailey. And that happened over the weekend while visiting her. It was also clear that Jay's teacher noticed the impact within his school setting, asking the counselor to check in with him. While the counselor did state it was January in her letter, this was a mistake. 
She th further clarifies this, but it is not egregious or unexpected mistake of a school staff trying to get through the week after spring break. It also does not detract from the substance or of the concern for Jay, nor what he reported. After respondent's attorney contacted the school counselor when she signed the May 1st letter, she did not recall the specifics as well as respondent now alludes to coaching because of adult phrases used by Jay. However, this is not an accurate representation of my son or my relationship with him. The respondent is being disingenuous in a representation that is new or out of character for our extremely gifted boy. My son is very advanced, intelligent, articulate, and emotionally evolved child. He has always communicated to this degree, as is natural when all those in his family communicate in the same manner. Even in the second letter, when the counselor appears to second guess a recollection, indicates that he uses adult phrases to describe his circumstances, and that she thought that the phrases may have been ones repeated by his dad. But if the court looks back to her first letter, she was clear that she disclosed where he had where he was that weekend, and his disclosure specified that respondent discussed this with him. In subsequent meeting with Jay, the school counselor further explains Jay naturally communicates in this manner. So her newly raised doubts are simply not a concern. This would also be something acknowledged by the GAL in the previous litigation as well. Further, significant weight should be given to his therapist. Respondent indicates, I have not informed her of Jay's therapy and that she has been kept in the dark. This is a complete mis misrepresentation of the facts. Our final parenting plan is barely a year old. Jay has been attending therapy with his provider, which was disclosed throughout the previous lit litigation for several years now. She has access to his information, has had several years to attempt to engage with Jay's providers, ask for guidance, seek advice, and stay apprised. Therapy where Jay works through his social and emotional struggles as well as his relationship to respondent began at the onset of the previous litigation and there was nothing new to report. Respondent is also aware of Jay's doctors, dentists, his ADHD management, school plans to support this diagnosis and more. Respondent has historically struggled to engage with Jay, let alone his providers. This is simply a misplacement of, this is simply a misplacement of responsibility. Respondent appears to expect that I inform of Jay's struggles with her when I cannot even conduct an exchange of her son without her causing an altercation. Also, respondent is a parent. Rather than give positive attention, respondent dismisses positive attentions in Jay's life and only gives attention to the negatives about me or missing her. She would know more about Jay's struggle if she engaged in a healthy manner and showed interest in the things that he is working on. Not only does respondent know of the provider, she also states that I informed her of the only new development once it happened. This is the basis of her contempt motion. Contact with the therapist regarding violations is written into the final orders, which respondent herself claims I violated. She cannot claim that I did not keep her apprised. The only new big thing that happened is the visit cancellation as a result of the exact disclosure respondent claims I didn't make to her on one hand, but then uses that as the basis of her motion. As a matter of substance, respondent attempts to imply that therapist uses passive words that she was trying to imply Jay may have been emotional only about my, my response when he disclosed what respondent said, instead of taking note of what Jay disclosed in therapy. Respondent would like the court to stretch to something with no evidence, no disclosure about a made up scenario that I have suddenly become angry and had outbursts at my son which she claims is where the emotions could have come from, instead of acknowledging that all the communications, previous reports by professionals and the GAL all indicate Jay's positive relationship and problem solving with me, which is documented repeatedly. Respondent intends to dismiss all of this and skew the statements. This is consistent with past behavior, interactions throughout all of our litigation, and further lends to the fact that she still continues as she did when the orders were written to sign me these exact things. Respondent first expects proof that our son told someone other than just me then wants to shoot down anyone who Jay disclosed this to. I asked the court to consider what the therapist, school counselor both stated initially, that Jay has been told about the court action, about who had better attorneys, that he gets to make a choice in his residence, and that he should choose respondent. They did not in any way imply that Jay was upset in my response to anything. In fact, the only fear reported was the school counselor that Jay couldn't see respondent until he was 18 if he shared their description. Jay did not make any disclosures that would indicate concern of my actions. It would be completely opposite of the last four years of interactions with both respondent and myself and Jay. This is simply made up and the court should not consider this. The concern for this specific behavior was addressed within the parenting plan after respondent's continual pattern of this exact type of action. Paragraph 14D in our final parenting plan gives explicit instruction that I'm supposed to, that I am to suspend in-person visitation if respondent violated the orders in that manner. As respondent's behaviors are the reason I was forced to take this action as the order directs me to. I do not believe I violated any orders, minimally. Respondent attempts to introduce new allegations at the tail end of the declaration, which I cannot respond to. Another indication of her lack of engagement with Jay was the reasoning behind the tile tracker in Jay's his shoes and clothing. Jay hit a big age milestone where he was allowed more freedom and was able to walk to school starting this school year. He had to show he could be responsible to get to school on time, as well as, as, well as have adult supervision without embarrassing him while parents fall in the car. The compromise we came to was that Jay would have the tile with him so that if he got off task or was going to be late, we could monitor and go pick him up. We also later... 
We also later sewed this into a pair of his shorts on a vacation to Seattle. It was a big city. We were there for five days and regularly taken precautionary safety measures that are similar. Respondent could have simply showed interest in anything non-negative and asked Jay, asked, and Jay would have told her. Or who knows, maybe he did and she brushed it off like so many other details important to Jay. It's respondent's own exhibits. They further corroborate what I have reported to the court. While showing the respondent clearly sees the issue is with my unwillingness to engage in parenting decisions, discussions with her at exchanges, not with her escalation. No does, nor does it, nor does not mean, sorry, no does not mean no to respondent by her own admission. If she has to escalate, yell, or engage in abusive behavior, the problem is obviously that I did not give in to her demand, despite the court ordering us to discuss the, those things on Our Family Wizard. Additionally, I would not have waited to file documents if it were not for the fact that respondent and her counsel gave the impression that it was reasonable and expected to wait for documents from Jay's providers. Respondent's counsel expressed this to me, expressed to me that he didn't understand or see how Jay could be mentally or emotionally impacted by this incident. I would need those for filing a motion with the courts. They wanted to see them and I understood respondent's attorney was following up on the agreement to begin visits in the proposed joint therapist. Three weeks still is not an unreasonable amount of time. After I obtained the documents, the Friday I indicated I would have them, I was able to turn around and file documents within a couple of days. This was not a willful violation of the court's orders. This was normal delays that are expected when working with professionals in these communities. It is not, it is not reasonable that respondent was informed in new timeline by which I could obtain the documents to file insist I have those documents or I could not file, then rush to beat me there and point the finger at me for not being fast enough. I have maintained regular phone call visits with respondent. I have not withheld of Jay unreasonably. It is in fact very reasonable to believe and supported within the orders that respondent did and would have those discussions with Jay. This is historically consistent with her pattern behavior and what Jay and what warranted the orders in the first place. It is also disheartening that she would brush off the concerns and blame Jay or imply he or I have been the ones who have begun behaving in, in the way she herself is known for. However, this is also consistent with her patterns of behavior. This is, these are corroborating documents that indicate these behaviors have continued in smaller ways. Even respondent provides documents to the courts which agree continues to behave in this manner. Her behaviors are causing Jay's significant struggles. This is known and historically consistent fact. The court should deny respondent's motion, deny her request for makeup time and attorney's fees. I should not be held financially liable for respondent's bad behaviors, nor for not adhering to an undefined timeline, especially if I'm required to obtain documents provider, from providers in the community. She should also not be rewarded for her actions with makeup time. Instead, I implore the court to consider my motion for relief, where I requested the court order respondent to engage in healthy relationship building settings with Jay. Would it be appropriate now to go into my counter motion for relief, Your Honor? Um, <clears throat> I, I'm not going to hear any argument on that. Uh, I know what I'm going to do there. I may, res I may respond a few brief points, Your Honor. Very briefly. Sure. First of all, there absolutely was no agreement that the parties were working towards. We have showed that in our exhibit. On March 10th, Ms. Koski stated, we can have visitation and we can talk about some sort of therapy. Mr. Brock responded that same day with dispute resolution of the parenting plan, go to court. There has never been any other statements. And while I, as an attorney, cannot be a fact witness to a case that I'm advocating for, I'll simply state that the conversation is inaccurate as presented. Now, as for the moment that it happened, respondent states that he reached out immediately, but that's not in the record. He never even mentioned therapists in March 10th. It wasn't until we got to April that Ms. Koski even knew about some kind of therapist. We had to force the issue. And that is actually the butt of the problem. It took this long. It should not take this long. He withheld for almost two months before we even actually understood that there was a therapist involved. Second, it's not even clear from the therapist's records, A, that the distress the child was exhibiting was so significant that it rises to the level of having to suspend visitation. It's also not even clear that it is a direct result of the mother's actions. And the reason I say that is because it is simply a logical fallacy. At the same time that mother starts unsupervised visits in August, we also have the contemporaneous records from Ms. Koski that the child is disclosing to her on the same day. These are contemporaneous records. He's disclosing that Mr. Brock is yelling at him, calling his mother a drug user. We have records too from, uh, uh, from Carissa that, these, uh, that the child is disclosing that father is saying, that he is evil, the child's evil, for wanting to stay with the mother. So this is happening at the same time. And going back again to Ms. Malloy's records, which by the way, was from a visit from April 17th, that that is not, I'm not stretching anything here. She is using passive voice. She doesn't know where the child got these ideas. You know who else doesn't know? Mother, because mother's not the one saying this. And that's actually what Mr. Brock needs to prove. 
that it's mother who is, un, who is involving the child in these decisions, and he cannot do that. That is why these are hard to prove. And again, the court required that he file his concerns immediately. And as he's already stated, he, he's well-versed in the plan. He even knew it on March 10th. There's disputes. You go to court. He absolutely knew what to do. The, the issue with the air tag and, and, and then spying on mother. Listen, why not just be honest with the child? You're going to be on your own. We're going to give you this air tag so that you know, we can help keep track of you when you're on your own. He doesn't say that. He expresses concern to mother about why they're, they're surreptitiously hiding these things in his pockets. Objection. And it's in the record. Thank you. So, <laughs> you could, okay. the entire vote. We're, we're moving on, Mr. Brock. Okay. Go ahead, Mr. Hunter. And then finally, the last point I'll make is about this, this exchange where petitioner keeps stating that mother is yelling at him through a window. The fact is, is, she wasn't yelling at anything. He has a window. She's trying to talk to him about an infection on the child's nose after his time with father. Of course, Ms. Brock's ignoring that and states, hey, go through our family wizard, which she does. And we have provided that in an exhibit that exact same night. She messages him about just that issue. One week later, he still has the problem with his nose. It is still a problem a week later. This is not some runny nose as petitioner keeps trying to put it. There's a serious problem there that mother was trying to talk about. That's not like wild yelling and losing her mind. But frankly, I think there's been plenty enough said about this. Um, that's all I have, Your Honor. As far as the um, counter motion for relief, I'm gonna deny that. The language doesn't, isn't work. I understand what the hope is. Um, to accomplish. And uh, to be very frank, I, I remember Mr. Brock, I remember Ms. Kosky, I, I think I was the judicial officer that handled kind of an informal trial to set all this. I uh, recall both parties being very emotional over this child. And, and I, I still to, to this day, I have no doubt that both parties want the best for their child. Uh, doesn't, may not kind of appear that way at this point, given some of the contentious behavior back and forth. But I, uh, I, I believe that they both have deep care and feelings for this this boy and, and want the best for him. I want to remind them that that's, that's what's most important. And um, it, it feels like some of this is a little territorial in the end, it's a child, so it's not territorial. If there's a closeness to one parent, maybe more than the other, that's just how it is. Uh, and uh, that could change from week to week or month to month or year to year. Uh, as far as the contempt goes, I, I, th I think we have, a, Technically speaking, I think there, there is a contempt. I'm not going to make a finding of a residual uh, residential provision being violated. I understand Mr. Uh, Brock was believed that he was following the parenting plan. The concern I have is that's a substantial amount of visitation that's just missing now uh, on his own accord with no motion. And it does appear that the contempt was filed about um, almost a month after the initial uh, concerns or the stop in visitation. Um, I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to award attorney's fees in this matter. I think this is a, something that we just, we need to clear up. I do see the concern, some of the language, uh, and frankly, in the, in the most recent, uh, supplemental information that Mr. Brock filed, uh, it's, it's notable that the school counselor, um, kind of says this is a smart kid. He uses language that is kind of advanced for his age, uh, terminology that's, that's maybe something that you wouldn't hear from a, a child of his age. To be very frank, he's likely picking up on a lot of things that both parties may not realize that he's picking up on, uh, just given uh, what appears to be his high level of intelligence and comprehension levels. Uh, I don't know who indicated these things. It's concerning information. Both parties should obviously understand that there should not ever be any discussion with the child regarding the other parent, the parenting plan, the case, anything of that nature. Um, but I, I can't sit here and say mom's the one who coached child to say something or be upset. Uh, at anyone regarding anything. Um, I understand Mr. Brock's position is that's what um, the child said to him. I'm, and and I, I'm taking that for what it's worth. I'm not suggesting Mr. Brock is, uh, can, you know, uh, making that up. Uh, but I, I don't, with the, with everything that I have before me, I, I'm, I, I'm not going to say mom's in complete violation of the parenting plan and everything needs to stop. Uh, I do think it's probably appropriate, given the nature and the historical nature and, and kind of the findings that were made in the parenting plan, uh, that there that maybe we have Miss Malloy engaged in a process to get mom back in uh, in her visitations. I don't know if uh, I know that there was some there was and I forgive me, I don't know who alluded. I think Mr. Brock uh, indicated that 
maybe there was a request for um, counselor to be like some, a group therapy session or I, at least the counselor kind of uh, mediate uh, the situation uh, a couple of times. I think that's probably appropriate, uh, but I think visitations should resume um, as soon as that, as soon as that can happen. I'm not going to order that there's a makeup time. We're frankly coming into the summer session and during the summer visitation um, changes drastically. Uh, I, I think it's 10 days on, seven days off. Uh, I don't believe, I believe it starts off It's a step up plan for uh, one week and then following years, uh, two weeks and so on and so forth. I could be mistaken by a day or two, Your Honor. Yeah, mothers to have child phase one, summer 23 consists of 10 days with the child and seven days with the child non-continuous. So we'll okay, so two, so a ten-day period and a seven-day period. Is that what? So yeah, like yeah non-continuous. <clears throat> okay, I believe that was the language for that was uh, it couldn't be seventeen straight days. Right. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Rock. Yes. So, um, is there? Um, how soon is the? Um, so she was supposed to have visitation this past weekend. So, so it wouldn't be this weekend. It would be the weekend after. Is that correct? That's and correct. Weekend, it would be the 19th through the 21st. That's correct. Okay. Um, I'd, I'd like visitation to take place on that week. I'd, I'd, and ideally, if there can be, um, even if it has to be a FaceTime uh, phone call uh, that Ms. Kosky, Kosky reach out to Ms. Malloy prior to that. And Ms. Malloy also have a conversation with Mr. Brock. And I'm going to set this on um, for review and presentation on the 23rd at one o'clock. And uh, that way, if there are any concerns from either the counselor or the interactions over the weekend, we can discuss that at that so point. In time. If I may just ask some clarifying questions, are we we're denying the counter motion? Yes. The contempt motion is. I, I'm going to make a finding of contempt. I'm not making a finding of the residential provision violated, and I'm and I'm saying that Understood. understanding the technical navigation issues, and I and and I, frankly, I don't think the petitioner. Um, I think it was willful, but I think he thought he was doing what he was supposed to be doing. Uh, um, so I, I am technically making a finding of contempt. I'm not finding any judgment, and I'm not ordering any makeup time, but I am ordering that visitations resume. Understood, Your Honor. Uh, Your Honor, if I may ask uh, a layman version of of what that means. I, I get the I, I get that second half, but the contempt aspect. So, uh, there was a, a request for a specific type of violation of contempt. I'm not making that finding. So the the residential provision violation. I'm not finding that, but I am finding you in contempt uh, based on uh, not bringing the matter immediately to court when there was a concern. Uh, I, but I'm not doing entering any judgments or make up time at this point. Okay, um, Your Honor, if I may. I would prefer not to break the safe relationship Jane has with this current therapist, um, but just in case, in case that's not, um, I mean, he spent a long time building rapport with her. Um, but I, I was wanting to also see if I could request uh, Allison Long, who does joint family and reunification therapies, if if it's if she has availability. I just know that um, she's a professional in the community. Uh, just as a backup, so that there's not any. And I guess I understand your concern. What I'm hoping that Miss Mal I'm hoping that Miss Malloy can just have an independent conversation with both parents, mm -hmm. uh, and not. And I don't want that's not something that I want her to have a conversation with um, Jaden about. That's not something that I. So I. I guess my preference would be that he be oblivious. So there's no. There's not a concern that she's relaying information. Um, but to be very frank, if if Miss Koski hasn't ever spoken with her, there may be some really good insight that they can provide each other to help both sides you know, move forward. Um, Jaden and Ms. Kosky, Jaden and Mr. Brock, Ms. Kosky and Mr. Brock. So uh, she may be, and, and I, so I understand your, uh, your concern. If Ms. Kosky, uh, as you indicated in your argument was, is willing to consider having um, kind of a mutual session with Ms. Long sometime in the future, I have no, I'm not going to bar that. I'm not going to order it though, either. So if that's something that uh, Ms. Kosky is willing to, to work with you on for the best interest of Jaden, then I'm happy to hear that. And I think that would be a great idea. Okay. Thank you. Really. All right.